throughout history, the butcher has been a linchpin to survival. In early civilizations, when foodborne diseases were claiming lives, it was the butcher, with their sharp tools and sharper skills, who kept death at bay. Across centuries, butchers were as highly regarded as doctors and eventually became a fixture in nearly every town across America. Today, there are thousands of people who cut meat, but only a select few with the expertise to call themselves Master Butcher. Tonight, in three escalating rounds to test speed and precision. You're over. Four of America's best butchers will battle it out for prize money and pride, culminating in a final challenge against a surprise beast. Awesome. Right here on The Butcher. My name's Dan. Coming from the Marine Corps, I needed something to give me purpose. I thought, butcher. There's been butchers since the beginning of time. You will always need butchers, forever and a day. My name's Brianna. People train for this. They go to school and they like learn to trade. And what I love about being a butcher is that I can control my food supply. People trust me with their food and I find it really empowering. My name's Joey. I've been a butcher for 30 years. This is a passion for me. I come out here with one purpose and that's win this competition, take the money and go back home. My name is Brandon. I have never worked in a retail shop. I've never worked under a butcher who's showed me anything. Being self-taught, I am intensely curious about how I cut meat relative to people who have been trained in that environment. Butchers, welcome to the shop. You are here to throw down in a three-round showdown designed to put your skills to the ultimate test. At the end of the day, only one of you will be able to call yourself the butcher champion and take home the $10,000 prize. The money would be great, but what I'm in it for is the prestige. I want to be able to add to my skill set. You can't just call yourself a butcher. You have to have knowledge under your belt. If you win, you're stepping it up a notch. Judging this competition are some of the toughest experts in the industry. First up, hailing from the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee is the Reverend of Fat, Michael Sully Sullivan. Up next, she's an avid hunter, an accomplished chef, and she butchers whole animals, Miss Roxanne Spruance. And last, but certainly not least, a 30-year veteran and fourth-generation butcher who learned the trade on the sawdust-covered floors of old San Francisco. His middle name says it all, Dave the Butcher Budworth. In this industry, the judges, they're huge. I'm impressed. Now let's get down to business. Our first challenge, we call it breaking from the rail. The technique of breaking from the rail started in the late 19th century, when the meat industry was booming in the stockyards of Chicago. To maximize space, meat was hung from rails. And in a move to speed up production times, butchers would break down the meat right on the hooks, instead of moving it to the table and carving it up the way Europeans had done for centuries. Man, I haven't done that in 20 plus years. All right, butchers, there is a meat locker behind you. You want to see what you're working with? Let's do it. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Turn around and take a look. Oh. Whole pigs. Working from the rail, you need to split it in half, then break it down into four sections you butchers call primals. The shoulder, loin, belly, and leg. You will then cut those primals into as many retail cuts as possible. But know this, any cuts that do not meet the judge's standards will be rejected. The three butchers that yield the most cuts will move on to round two. You will have 60 minutes for this challenge. To make this interesting, we're going old school. Yeah. You will be using one of the oldest tools known to butchers. This two-handed meat cleaver, also known as a splitter. Oh, it's sharp. I've never worked with one of those. I work with cleavers in the shop, but nothing as gargantuan. I hope I can handle that thing. Man's use of the cleaver dates back to the Stone Ages, when they were fashioned from deer antlers. The tool didn't take on its modern form until the Middle Ages, when steel became widely used for bladed tools throughout Europe. Weighing in at over 10 pounds, the two-handed cleaver is a beast of a blade. Its thicker edge makes it perfect for splitting through tough sections of an animal. While these cleavers are still available, they are rarely, if ever, used thanks to modern power saws. 
you will have access to all the tools in the shop, like the bandsaw and all of the hand saws. Most importantly, you're going to be able to use your own scabbards and knives. Butchers, grab your splitter. It is time to select your swine. Oh, boy. That's a thing of beauty. I'm excited to rip some swine. Normally, you would get your pig split on a bandsaw right down the spine so that it's perfectly even. We're giving them a bit of a challenge. It's hanging. It's going to move around. They're going to have to hit it spot on along the spine because if they go off on one angle, they're going to cut into that precious meat. All right, butchers, here we go. Three, two, one. My strategy is to move directly down the spine. Yeah, it's just pumping that spine. Based on the fact that we're working on a time restraint, I'm cutting just as fast and frantically as I can. Joey's losing pieces of the pig because he's trying to go too far through. Look at that loin that's coming right out. When you look at Rihanna, she's pulled a lot of power. She's putting too much of her energy in instead of letting this heavy blade do the work for her. She's doing all the work, and that's just going to make you exhausted. Yep, her arm's going to be jello. So it looks like Dan is totally through now, guys. Yeah. Yes. Dan is the first one back to his block. That is a nice squared off shoulder. Doesn't look like it's hacked up from splitting. Cutting the shoulder, my brain went wham, and I see all the pieces in my head. I'm going to pay attention to the detail. I really want my cuts to impress. A butcher can get seven types of cuts from the shoulder. And today, we are focused on what is known as the Boston butt. Boston butt is a piece from the shoulder, from the neck side of the shoulder, that has great fat content. Coming out. Coming out. Rihanna, the last one in the cooler. She's awkward with that cleaver. I am mangling this thing. All right. This is embarrassing. She's not that far off. What is Joey doing with his saw right now? I have no idea. It's like a wood saw. Yeah. Cut down a sapling with uh, yeah, right? <laughs> we brought tools to get the job done. Sure, we have automated tools, but it's about being a true craftsman. I own and operate Clampus Country Kitchen and Meat Market with my beautiful wife, Lynn. We have a full-service meat market, barbecue restaurant. I'm always keeping safety in mind, because this is a very dangerous job. I've got a half a dozen stab wounds, a few nicks with the saw, a few cuts, scars. We've got a Boston butt. Boston butt is revered because it has so much marbling in it. You'll find it used for pulled pork, carnitas. That is probably one of my favorite, favorite cuts of meat. This is a Boston butt. Score the skin for crackling. It is wasteful to just skin them because they are covered in crispy pig skin that will crisp up into little chips. Look at the scoring technique, just the tip of his knife, not going in too deep. And the reason you want to score a skin, when it cooks, the fat can release and dries the skin. My skill set is score. It's not something I do on a regular basis. We don't have many skin-on products, so that's typically something you're going to do with the skin-on product. I'm tying up my pork shoulder right now. We just scored. I'm getting ready to do the pork butt skin on. I have two blades that I can tear down any animal on the planet with. A 12 inch scimitar and my boning knife. That's a five inch rigid boning knife. It doesn't have any flexibility to it. I am the head butcher at Bisher's Quality Meats in Ramona, California. We got a hind quarter right here. I'm what you would call a farm butcher. I go out to people's houses when they have raised their own animals. And when it does come time for them to go down, you need somebody who gives them the respect that they deserve. I find honor in that. I am done with the shoulder. Brandon so, headed back into the cooler. Now for the belly. The first butcher ready for his second primal. A butcher can get three cuts out of the belly. Today, we're focusing on the pork belly and my favorite, bacon. Cut way in, but not too far. Usually, you just take off the belly and the loin simultaneously. I'm gonna take it off on its own, and that will give me the whole belly. Woo. 
It's a big belly. They're a big pig. Nice. After 20 minutes of cutting, Brianna's making her way back into the cooler. She's the second one in. With three primals to go, it looks like Brandon is in the lead. What kind of mangled hack job do I got here? Oh my god, I really messed up the rib bones. We see a lot of the meat hanging off, and that could cost her on the judge's block. I screwed this up really bad. All right, well, I'm Our butchers have been cutting for 20 minutes, and it is anybody's game. All right, what kind of mangled hack job do I got here? I don't have any of my bones left on my loin to do my French. Oh no, no, never mind. I'm good. I'm good. I'm overreacting. I thought that I'd really messed up the rib bones, but I'm okay. Knife sharp coming out. We got some sweat rolling, throwing stuff up here. Done. For the shoulder, going for the belly. All four butchers are tied up with seven cuts each and three primals left to get through. Butchers, 30 minutes down, 30 minutes to go. I'm freaking out. The only thing I'm thinking about is getting everything done as fast as I can. All right, you gotta skin this. You can get a corner started, and then you angle up the knife. I'm gonna cut off all of the skin, leaving all the fat on the belly for the bacon. You wanna see the knife. That means that we're leaving the maximum amount of pork fat under there. The skin is nice and dry, so it's not too hard to skin it beautifully. That's a little thick. We're gonna get one better. The trick is you want those nice, even cuts. Taking your knife and bringing it back, really making sure you get those straight lines. My business is Farmstead Meatsmith, and my shop is right next to my house. I have a predilection for the old ways of doing things because they're simpler and they're purer, usually. Less mediated by technology, more dependent upon skill. In my shop, I don't have a bandsaw. Every pig I butcher, it's just bone saw and cleaver and the knife. This is an old butcher knife. It's very dense, so it can hold a more acute edge and very precisely slice bacon. You know, judges, it's important to keep in mind while the butchers are trying to put as many cuts on the table as possible. If they don't meet your standards, they are going to be rejected. Yes. Look, look how she's taken her, her bacon slices. She rolled the mm -hmm. belly to cut them. Is that that way she can get very skills? easy and very even cut. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because you don't have you're not going the full track. length. Making bacon. Don't worry about that salt in my sweat It's helping cure the bacon. You can charge more for that, I think. Yes. Brandon, right now, he's tying up that pork belly. Guys, pork belly is my favorite. I mean, you get that equal parts of, like, fat <laughs> and lean. I mean, you can brace it. You can smoke it. Why is the tying important? The main reason is so that it cooks evenly, especially when you have something where there are pieces boned out and you have all these like flaps together to hold it together, to have it all cook evenly is really the ultimate goal. Butchers tie for the same reason chefs do, but we also have to tie to present and put in a meat case. You notice how she's tying? She starts in the middle. That way, it disperses it out evenly. If you look over at Dan's, it goes from small yeah. to kind of big, because he's starting at one end. That's not ideal. Move down to the line. A master butcher can get as many as six cuts from the loin. Today, we are paying closest attention to the butterfly chops. This is my loin. It's kind of mangled. Got my tenderloin. That's great. It's time to face the music. <sighs> I took a big chunk right out of my tenderloin, which is, you know, obviously a big no-no. So now I need to accommodate things a little bit differently. So we're gonna cut that right about here. You know, Brianna, again, that cleaver work. Now you gotta work around some of those mistakes you did when you split the pig. All right, what can I do with this? Butchers, you have 20 minutes left. As he starts to cut his loin, Dan is in the lead. Brianna is not far behind. Brandon and Joey are both rolling their bellies. Now we're gonna go to the loin. With the loin, it's very easy to get your angle wrong. That's the magic vertebra right there, ladies and gentlemen. Any quadruped can be quartered right there. One vertebra from the crook in the spine in the direction of the head. Boom. Just make sure you grab a hold of something because there's no bone there to hold it. It's just kind of awkward because you need to catch as you're cutting it off. And then we're just gonna pull a little bit. Try not to cut our face off. I got more experience than anybody here and um, more arthritis. My hands are getting really tired. They're really starting to cramp up on me, but that's okay. We're going to fight through it. We got the belly portion done. Going in for the loin. 
Fix and get some pork chops. Woo, coming through now. Bam. With the loin primal, I'm gonna use the cleaver. Aim with the heel. That's when you're most accurate. This is my favorite cleaver. I bought an old butcher block, and as we were driving away, the woman that we bought it from came running out with a cleaver in her hand. <laughs> the cleaver her father used on that block. And she thought that it wasn't right that they should be parted. It happens to be the most functional cleaver that I have and the most meaningful. So here's an interesting thing. Oh, Look at this. Wow. Look how he's trying to shine it. This could get you into trouble real fast. Easily, that cleaver could slip off and go into the meat, but it looks like he's done it before. Brandon, have you used a saw at all yet, guy? No. He's a beast over here, y'all. I'm working on my butterfly chops. Butterflying is not cutting all the way through it. It's cutting three quarters of the way and, and opening it up. Open. So it's still like one piece of meat. This is not the ideal place to take them from, but because I messed up the, the tenderloin, I'm improvising. The whole point of butterflying is that you're taking one thick piece and making it thinner so that you're able to cook it more quickly and enjoy it that much sooner. Butchers, you have reached the 10 minute mark. I'm not really concerned with what my competitors are doing. I know it's just me versus the clock. If I can buckle down and finish strong, I'm really in this competition. I'm moving to the leg. From the leg primal, you can get about six cuts. Today, the judges are gonna pay closest attention to the ham steaks. Ham steaks, bone in. It's the big round piece with a little circle piece of femur bone in it. It's a great economical cut of meat. The clock's ticking. I want really nice ham steaks, but my cuts are getting a little sloppier. I feel crunched. I have to do the leg as fast as possible. All four butchers are on their final primal. We're gonna cut them some damn steaks. It's gonna look like an official Dr. Seuss roast beast. Appearance is going out the window. We're just trying to get product on the table. I'm just gonna start throwing stuff out. I have to admit, those are beautiful ham steaks. I know. Butchers, this is your one minute warning. You're Ooh. running out of time. 60 seconds left. A few more cuts could be the difference of me going home or going to the next round. We're coming down to the wire. It's neck and neck right now. Five, four, three, two, one. Woo. Time's up. Step back from your stations, please. I think I got through everything, and I know at the very least, even if I didn't finish as much as I wanted to, it's all clean. Now it's time for y'all to head back to the stock room while the judges inspect your work. My goodness, that was intense. Okay, judges, Brandon has displayed 20 cuts. Love this pork belly. Look how tight it's tied. That would just roast off so beautifully. Mm -hmm. Props for his hand steaks. Look at how even these are being cut by hand, and part of that is his attention to detail and his knife work of cutting through the meat all the way down to the bone before he even gets the saw out. His butterfly chops here, he butterflied them backwards. Normally, you would cut half a chop down, and that would give you your butterfly chop. Mm -hmm. He cut them from this side down to the skin. So they're, they're basically done backwards. We're here at Joey's table. He has 19 cuts. The butterfly work on loin chops are really nice. The bacon, nice even cuts. But the scoring on some of these products is just way too deep. He went all the way through. Ham steak, it almost looks like he started to cut two and end up with one. With the tenderloin, has the hole in it and it's a little torn here. It still could be prepared. It's not the end of the world. We are at Brianna's table. She has 21 cuts here. This tenderloin is really small. Makes me wonder where the rest of that is. <laughs> the swing hit right in yeah. the butt, an mm. awesome part of my tenderloin. Yeah. Her butterfly chops, although they are butterflied properly, they're too thin so you can see where they broke through. All right, judges, Dan has 20 cuts. Dan's blade chops are perfect thickness. They're evenly trimmed. They're just well done. That pork belly is just totally off. This should really be an even piece all the way down. We've got an issue oh. down here. Look at, it's the whole thing is falling so, apart. You know, so that right there, it's uncookable. I know my ham looks like double hammered dog snot. <laughs> <laughs> Butchers, you all did great work, but only three of you will move on to the next round. The butcher going home is... Butchers, only three of you 
We'll move on to the next round. Brandon, after the judges inspected your work, you have a final total of 19 cuts. Brianna, you also have a total of 19 cuts. Congratulations to you both. You are moving on in the competition. You can head back to your block. Thank you. Good job. Good luck, man. Thank you, man. Joey and Dan, you both battled hard, but unfortunately, one of you is going home. Dan, after the judges inspected your work, you finished with 17 cuts. Joey, you finished with a grand total of 12 cuts. Congratulations, Dan. You're moving on to the next challenge. You can head back to your block. Joey, we can tell that you're a great butcher. I think time management was kind of your downfall to getting a lot of your clean cuts. I agree. All right, Joey, it is time for you to leave the shop. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank y'all. Good luck, everybody. See you, Joey. I'm grateful for having the opportunity to compete with such a great caliber of craftsmen. I didn't do as good as I'd like to have done, but it really makes me proud to see this younger generation continuing to carry on this art form that I've made a career out of. Butchers, it is time for the next challenge. We call this one the eyeballer. As all of you know, a true master butcher should be able to cut a piece of meat to the exact ounce before it even hits the scale. Here's the challenge. You're each going to start with a beef short loin. This is where the most desirable cuts of steak come from, like the T-bone and the porterhouse. You must then carefully break it down to a tenderloin, which is the tender muscle that runs along the spine and is used for filet mignon. From there, you must cut a properly cleaned and trimmed filet that is exactly six ounces. But here's the twist. You don't get to see how much your filet weighs. If your filet is over, you'll have the opportunity to go back and correct it. But if it's under, it'll be discarded. In the event that you run out of tenderloin, you're gonna have to go back to the meat locker and cut another one. The first two butchers to deliver five perfect filets that are exactly six ounces will advance to the next round, where you will go head to head in our final challenge. Ready, set, cut. Sully, how often do butchers eyeball while they're working? is really that foundational skill for butchery. And, and it's something we perfect from the very beginning of our career to the end. Once you get comfortable to save time, you barely use the scale. My strategy for this challenge is to cut my steaks bigger than what I think they would be, and then trim them down a little bit at a time until I'd hit that weight. The tenderloin's a really soft muscle, but you've gotta be really careful not to nick it with your knife. Really keep the knife against the bone as they're pulling it away. Once you get it off and you're peeling off that silver skin, it's really easy to gouge into it. Explain what silver skin is. Silver skin is like a tough a film of sinew. It's a connective tissue. You can break it down and it gets very gelatinous, but you don't want to eat that. You really want to make sure that it's one clean motion so that you're not kind of nicking into that meat because that's what's going to make your final filet undesirable. Looks like Dan's up first. Your filet is under. Dan's first filet is underweight, so that one's going to be discarded. Here comes Brandon. Brandon, your filet is over. Wow. This is the one thing that I was worried about. Portioning is a different language for me, and it's not something I do ever. Oh, what am I doing, man? The first two butchers to deliver five perfect filets that are exactly six ounces will advance to the next round. But here's the twist you don't get to see how much your filet weighs. I think I'm pretty good at guessing, but without using a scale, I know this is going to be a challenge. Your filet is over. Thank you. Dan's already back up. Once you get it clean, you're just making those portion cuts. Dan, your filet is over. I know it ain't gonna happen right off the bat. I just don't wanna go under, so I lose it. Your filet is still low. A six ounce filet is so difficult because it's not like a norm. Eight ounces is more of a butcher yeah, for shop. Yeah, a butcher shop be eight to 10 ounces. Trying to find that sweet spot of six ounces, it's a tough challenge. Your filet makes weight. Brianna's Three on the board. Ounce. First one to score. All right, making moves. Your filet is under. 
blows my mind that I blew through one tenderloin just with errors. Dan, you also have a beautiful six ounce there filet. There we go. And Dan, back up at the scale. Another beautiful six ounce filet. <laughs> Dan, first one to put two fillets down. Your fillet is under. I'm really stressed out. I keep being under the weight. I am trying to hit it exact, and the strategy is not working. Has he ever worked in a butcher shop or a restaurant where he does portioning? No. This could be a killer for him. Don't do too much. I'm trying to calculate the thickness of the tenderloin, and I am missing it. You have a beautiful six ounce filet. Woo. Brandon gets Brandon his got first one. Brandon steak. is on the board. Yes. I'm holding on to that one steak that I got. Of course, trying to like remember exactly how it felt in my hand. All I have to do is that four times. So Brandon back up to the scale. Beautiful filet. Oh, Brandon puts another one on the board. Beautiful six ounce oh, filet. We're all tied up in two. Another beautiful six-ounce filet. Dang. Brandon, you also have a beautiful six-ounce filet. Brandon ties it up with Dan with three steaks. So Dan is now going for his third short loin. Right now, it'd be a matter of wasting time boning out more short loin. Brianna's back up at the scale. You now have a beautiful six-ounce filet. We are tied up at three steaks race. each. Brianna's still on her second short loin. She could still easily get two more out of that tenderloin. Absolutely. You know? Of course, you Ooh. have another beautiful Thank six ounce filet. And with that, Brianna oh, takes man. the lead. Beautiful filet. Yeah. OK, Dan oh, ties oh, it man. up. Brandon's up. You are over. Brandon's over. Is this going to be the filet that wins it for Brianna? So I'm going up with what I'm hoping is my last piece. If that steak is even a little bit too small, I have to go back into the walk-in, get another short loin, break the whole thing down. And I know Daniel is so close. Brianna, you have a beautifully trimmed uh, and presentable six you. ounce filet. Oh, oh first is. one. Great job, Brianna. And with that, Brianna moves on in the competition. Slow and steady. I kept saying to myself, slow and steady is going to win this race. At this point, I am looking for a miracle. Dan goes up. If his is on, I'm done. All I need to do is concentrate on coming in second place. I really want to make sure that I beat Brandon out. He's my big worry. Dan, you have a beautiful six ounce filet, but let me make sure the trimming's good. This is an absolutely beautiful trim there six ounce is. filet. And there it, there it is. And Dan is moving on to the final round. Yeah. Brianna and Dan, they just nailed that portioning really well. I get lost in my perfectionism, and I just want to mm, nail it, you know, on one perfect cut. Those were some excellent knife skills you displayed there. Brandon, it really could have been anyone's game, but you've done a great job, and we can all tell that you're an amazing butcher, so thank, thank you. you. Brandon, we appreciate you being here, but it is time for you to leave the shop. It's a bummer to not go all the way. Portioning is never really a part of my butchery philosophy. If I had to pick a way to lose, I'm OK with losing on the portioning. Congratulations, Brianna and Dan. You have made it to the final battle. At the end of this next challenge, one of you is going to be walking out of here with $10,000. We call this next challenge, Meet the Monster. <laughs> Would you like to know why? Yeah. Here's your answer. Oh, that's so awesome. Yes! <laughs> we call this next challenge, Meet the Monster. <laughs> yeah! I see this gator. Immediately, I shove beef, pork, lamb, and everything out of my head. I am in game animal zone. No gators where I'm from. <laughs> I live in Canada, eat an alligator two times. This is gonna be badass. With 80 canine teeth and a bite force of 300 pounds per square inch, the alligator is more than a fierce apex predator lurking in America's marshes, wetlands, and swamps. It's also a popular source of sustenance and has been since the 1600s when the Choctaw tribe hunted them in Mississippi. Choctaws believe that gators possess great wisdom, and legend tells that if a hunter treated an alligator with respect, 
it would bestow this wisdom on the hunter, giving him great success. Gator meat can sell for an average of $8 per pound, but in the hands of a skilled butcher, more than $20 a pound. You guys know the cornerstone of this business is to get the most value out of the meat with as little waste as possible. For this challenge, each of you will have a gator. And using your skills as a master butcher, yield as much meat from the carcass as you can and turn it into quality retail cuts. The gator, wholly intact, is worth $675, but a master butcher could extract up to a thousand bucks in value cuts. The judges will weigh the worthy pieces and then they'll come up with a total dollar value of your yield. The butcher, who has the highest overall value, is gonna win it all. You have 90 minutes. I have never butchered a gator. I don't even know how people eat this thing. Like, I know stew, sausage, that's it. All right, boys, bring out the gators. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. This is where your training as a butcher is going to come in, looking at the anatomy and really letting the animal speak to you. Ready, set, cut. These guys have never broke down an alligator before. They're trying to figure out what they're dealing with. What mammal or animal have they butchered in the past that they automatically relate to? First thing I do is just kind of feel over it and see what I'm working with. What's happening? Alligator's kind of like a cross between a fish and a mammal. First time I cut a gator, I really had to bring my knowledge from working in a fish house, my knowledge of breaking lamb, of breaking beef, and figure out where the muscle groups are and what looks like a money cut. Trying to figure out what can I do with it to elevate my value. I'm thinking all animals have a filet. I know that they're excellent money pieces. That's my main focus to get off of this gator first. This is probably the craziest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Jelly roll cheeks, the rest of the tail meat are your money yeah, makers right money there. Maker. The jelly roll is the same as a filet mignon. It's the most valuable piece. Normally we call it a tenderloin, but in a gator we actually call it a jelly roll. It's kind of hidden within that tail, right up underneath. And it's the most tender, most prized to cut on an alligator. I'm just pulling a big, beautiful chunk off the tail. Look at Dan, how he's making sure that knife is right on that backbone. See that getting as much yield as possible. That is a beautiful yes. technique. That's an alligator meat. That could be the jelly roll. Yeah. When he took it off, he didn't separate the two muscles. That could be part of his jelly roll mm. with that back strap still on it. Yeah. Brianna's working on her tail, too. When you're butchering, you can use her hand to pave the way and kind of separate where you want your knife to go. And it looks like she might be finding the yes. jelly roll. That's something. She just said it to the side. I don't think she even understands the value of it. What would you do with it? If she would have cut steaks out of it, I mean, it's tender. So preserving that is paramount in this challenge. Absolutely. Butchers, 75 minutes remaining. Yeah, now I'm getting through this. They're going to judge us on yields, so I want to save everything that I possibly can. He's literally going in between each feather bone. Almost maybe too meticulous mm -hmm. here. Is that a time management problem? Kind of my strategy is go for the meatiest cuts first, because we're going going by weight here. Brianna's now working on the jowls, and I mean, that is a massive chunk of meat up there. Most people think, oh my gosh, it's gonna be tough. It's actually the second most tender part of an alligator. It's really sweet. Using just the tip of my knife here, just feeling it out and kind of hugging the bone really served me well. I really like both of their techniques. Look at her do that knife, those little small jab very much control. And this is a great example of seam work right here, just following that muscle. Butchers, we are 30 minutes in. You got this faster. Ah, come on, big boy. A typical way to tell if meat is tender is you kind of give it a poke with your finger. Well, this looks like I'm on the right track. This is their third challenge of the day. You know fatigue is setting in. The time is coming down, and we haven't seen one finished cut. Dan. First one to bring some oh, meat down go. to his presentation table. Oh, look how he forms it. That's beautiful. All right, let's start actually doing something here. Two totally different strategies. Dan has already brought a lot of his meat down. Brianna's still got all of hers staged up there. I was hoping to get all the muscles off in a certain time period. I did it in about 50 minutes. I was hoping it would take a little bit less time. And now I'm left with about 40 minutes to create my presentation. What is Dan tying up over there? Is that the jelly roll or is that part of the back strap? The jelly roll and the back strap are together. It devalues it, absolutely. 
The way I do my retail is big cuts, and then we can always shrink them down. We got a leg roast. Rihanna is starting to place on her presentation table. Jelly rolls, mm -hmm. she's just put out there whole. Cut it into steaks, and you're going to get much more money for it. That's an awfully large retail uh -huh. cut. It's our time. 30 minutes left. Roger that. If I was Brianna right now, I'd really be feeling the pressure. Absolutely. Freaking out. 30 minutes left. Oh, and oh, now we got the grinder. I'm trying to maximize my time, my output, my productivity. He's thinking about the sausage. There's something we can take less value meats and make the most money. Brianna pulled her grinder out. If they are going to make sausage, that $4 a pound meat now is worth $16 a pound. But he's going to get pork fat so he can bind his sausage. Gator meat is really lean. So you put that pork fat in there to hold it together. And then when you cook it, that pork fat's going to render into it and add flavor to the sausage. See how the meat is in long strips? Right. When you leave the meats long like that, the grinder pulls it in. When you cube them up, they just tumble. So what is Brianna packing together here with these big meatballs? I think they're meatballs. Meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Okay, Gator meatballs. I'm a quick student. <laughs> All right, butchers, 10 minutes remaining. 10 minutes. Do people eat alligator ribs? No idea. Look at how big that slab is. Here's the problem. You can't do a gator rib like you do pork ribs. Those bones would just deteriorate on that long, slow cooking process. What we see with Dan is a lot of finished, presentable cuts on his yep. table. What I see with Brianna, it's, it's all just large format. It's all pretty work. She's, she's a great butcher. If it was Christmas in my butcher shop, I'd put in big retail cuts. Like, on a regular daily basis, you don't put big cuts like that in. Oh, she's that going to try to get a sausage. Oh, no. Brianna definitely starting to feel the pressure of the clock now. She's still got a ton of stuff on her block. Butchers, you only have 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, time. Step away from your block. <laughs> Butchers, please head back to the stock room while the judges determine the overall value of your work. Butchering is also about eating. So with some cuts, you can't really judge them until they've been cooked. Rox, what do you feel like cooking for us today? Dan and Brianna obviously have a very different style, but I'd like to do something that we can really compare. And I think what that's going to be are these backstrap chops here with this beautiful vein of fat in. Excellent. If either doesn't cook well, it will be rejected and its value lost. We'll see in a little bit. I think you totally got me beat on weight. You got more on your plate. I was trying to put out retail cuts. Well, I feel good about what's on the table. I feel not good about what's not on the table. Here we are at Dan's table. Tell me what you like about his display. I'm liking these chops, beautiful fat line in them. Hopefully that renders out really nice. There's your jelly roll, but he left all this tough meat on the outside. This on its own could have been 40 bucks a pound, but with this on top, it's going to be 12 bucks a pound. So I wanted to pick two pieces that were kind of similar so that we could cook and compare them. Brianna tied hers, whereas Dan left it a bit thinner. Brianna's steak cooked up really well. Looks like we have some really good grill marks on here. I'm a little bit concerned about Dan's. See how loose this is already? This is definitely a cut that should have been tied. Tell me what you like about Brianna's display. I like her little chops. To me, this would look really pretty in a case. I'm happy that she found the jelly roll, but I'm not happy with her leaving this blood vein. She found it, she just didn't finish it. The other thing, I do not like these ribs. These are not like normal ribs. These are collagen, not bone. So during cooking, they would just disintegrate. Her sausage, she didn't use any kind of pork fat. You've got a lot of air pockets in here, right? So really, with the way this is gonna cook up, like dry taco meat. One thing that I noticed right off the bat is this is really tough to cut through. By the time it cooked all the way through, we didn't really have a chance to render any of this fat. Brianna slices so much more easily. It's good. All right, so let's try a piece from Dan's. Really hard to chew through. Out of these two steaks, I would definitely go with Brianna's. I'm gonna have to reject Dan's cut. If I were to win the $10,000, it would be a really good nest egg to expand my business. But I feel so great about the fact that I've made it this far. I already feel like I've won. To win is fantastic. The money, that's nice. But I've always loved calling myself a butcher. I like doing the work and I have the best job in the world. If I was gonna lose anybody, it'd be you. I agree, buddy. I'm really happy to have met you and worked with you. This has been great. 
So, judges, have you weighed the meat and determined which butcher has the highest overall value? Yes. We have. Let's bring them back into the shop. Brianna, even though you have never butchered a gator before, you handled it like you were in your own shop and yielded a lot of meat. Thank you. Dan, you also had never butchered a gator before. You worked fast and clean, and you delivered a table full of beautiful cuts. Brianna, your final value is $880.65. Dan, your final value is... $923. Nice job, buddy. Yes! Nice there job. It is. Rock the block! <laughs> oh, it feels nice so job. good. <laughs> Dave, any final word for Brianna? Brianna, we had to discard a couple of your cuts. Well, during cooking, they would just disintegrate. The way this is going to cook up, like dry taco meat. But I'm not happy with her leaving this blood vein. But nothing but respect. Thank you. And you're an amazing butcher. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Brianna. It is time for you to leave the shop. <laughs> Thank you so much. Even though I didn't win the Gator Challenge, I'm super proud of myself for what I've done in this competition. For me personally, I think this is a huge win. Dan, you just won $10,000, brother. And you Whoa! are... Yeah! Yeah! Hell yes! You are the butcher champion. That is right! How you feeling, man? It's too, it's too much coming on right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's baby. going on in that bald head of yours? Oh. <laughs> I am so elated, so happy. It's been so challenging, and I only hope that sooner or later I'll be able to pass all the knowledge that I have on to the younger generation of butchers so we can further our trade. The best butchers in the world do it day in and day out. They're always there. There's a sense of honor. There's a sense of pride, being good to your customers, being able to feed families and fill the freezers. That's, that's what it means. Brother, there's a bag of money waiting for you over there. <laughs> Head on out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Great job. I can't believe I did it, but I did. Hey, this is a legit life experience. That was super fun. I don't know too many people who have ripped down a gator. I can check that one off on my bucket list. history, the butcher has been a linchpin to survival. In early civilizations, when foodborne diseases were claiming lives, it was the butcher, with their sharp tools and sharper skills, who kept death at bay. Across centuries, butchers were as highly regarded as doctors, and eventually became a fixture in nearly every town across America. Today, there are thousands of people who cut meat, but only a select few with the expertise to call themselves Master Butcher. Tonight, in three escalating rounds to test speed and precision, you're over. Four of America's best butchers will battle it out for prize money and pride, culminating in a final challenge against a surprise beast. What the hell is that? Right here on The Butcher. My name is Tyler, and I've been a butcher for seven years. I used to be an amateur MMA fighter. I used to fight in cages. If you corner me, I'm extremely aggressive, and I will fight you until I'm dead. My name is Matt. I've been cutting meat for 46 years. I love what I produce. It is an art, but it's art for supper. There's nothing better than experience. So bring these kids on. My name is Tiffany. I've been a meat cutter for 10 years. I work at Charlie's Place. It's a family-run business. I just wanted to work next to my dad, and that's how I fell in love with being a meat cutter. I have an online profile, Badass Butcher Babe. My name's Chris. I knew I wanted to be a butcher at a young age. My dad was a butcher. There ain't no other job on the planet I'd rather do. At my shop, I'm the workhorse. I do all the hard jobs. I'm good at what I do. I'm here to win. Welcome to the shop. Your skills as butchers are about to be put to the ultimate test. In the end, one of you is going to win $10,000 and will be the butcher champion. 
Let's meet your judges, shall we? At the far end of the table, he's a fourth generation butcher who's been honing his craft for 30 years in the best shops in San Francisco, including his own. Meet Dave the Butcher Budworth. She hunts the meat, butchers the meat, and cooks the meat. An acclaimed butcher and chef, Chicago's own Roxanne Spruance. And finally, a master of seam butchery and technique, the Reverend of Fat, Michael Sully Sullivan. I recognize the judges. They are masters of their craft, and they are not gonna mess around. It's time to get down to business. And for this challenge, we mean big business. You want a hint? Yeah. Turn yeah. around, take a peek into the meat locker. Hit the switch, boys. <laughs> Beef. Hell yeah. yeah. I'm there. Oh, like, I'm not expecting a whole side of beef hanging there. A little intimidated? Uh -huh. Just a little. Looks like home. Yeah. I'm thinking, my gosh almighty, these are some big animals. Every day I cut sides of beef. I'm in. You are looking at nearly a ton of prime Black Angus beef. Though today you can find over 94 million cattle across America's 50 states, you might be surprised to know that before Christopher Columbus, there wasn't a single cow in North America. The explorer brought him over on his second trip in 1493. Between then and the 1800s, the bovine population grew exponentially, thanks to heavy imports from European cattle traders. Cut to today, Americans consume a yearly average of 56 pounds of beef per person. Butchers, you ready? Yes, yeah. sir. Working from the rail, you will break down your beef into section, what you butchers call primals. The chuck and shoulder, rib and plate, drop loin, and round. The challenge is for you to take that side of beef and break it down into as many retail cuts as possible. If your cuts do not meet the standards of our judges, they will be rejected and will not be counted towards your final cut total. Top three butchers will move on to the next round. Take a good look around the shop. We have all kinds of power tools and equipment, like that state-of-the-art bandsaw right there in the middle. But don't get too excited, because for this challenge, everything is powered by you. I'm a little concerned about that. <laughs> You've each brought your own scabbards with your best knives. But for this challenge, you are only allowed to use your boning knives and scimitars. We will provide the hand saws. You have your blades? Now you have two hours to complete this challenge. Please head into the locker and select your side of beef. Rox, how difficult is it to break down a side of beef like this? It's hard. It's hanging. It's going to move around. You have to use gravity, and you have to use leverage. Just the size alone would be intimidating. Yeah. Ratchets the pressure up <laughs> real quick. Yeah. All right, butchers, on my mark. Three, two, one, cut. Butchers are now removing the chuck and shoulder for their first primal. If I'm at home by myself, I can get a half beef cut in an hour and a half. I like the sense of urgency that everyone's moving with. Two hours seems like a lot of time, but it's, it's gonna gone. fly by. Tiffany's struggling a little bit. She is way too low. If Tiffany breaks not too low, then every cut that you make is gonna affect your necks. She's gonna leave part of her shoulder on a rack. It might be that she has never broken down primals this way since sometimes smaller shops get them delivered pre-cut. Chris is already using the saw here. Mm -hmm. Breaking beef with a handsaw is tough. To have a bandsaw would be great. So that's gonna be a bit of a challenge. Here it goes. So Tyler, first one out of the meat locker with his first primal. For me, this is taking something large, making it smaller. I believe in an assembly line process. You break and then you clean. I do like Tyler's technique, getting all those sub-muscle groups out, getting that bulk out of your way. Then That's you can come back and work in one thing at a time, clearing off that table. As many as nine types of cuts come from the chuck and shoulder. And today, we are focused on the flat iron steak. All right, we are looking good. This is that flat iron. This is a cut that I still use a good amount of practice on. Right in the flat iron, there's a seam right in the middle. If you cook that, it just doesn't break down. It's really tough. So great to see him bringing that right out. Why do they call it a flat iron steak? 
after you seam that out, it literally looks like an iron. A great little quick steak for dinner. My plan is try to do each primal in a half an hour. Chris working on his flat iron. Ah, dealing with buffalo, you don't see this much fat. <laughs> I work at Wild Idea Buffalo Company. I'm from Cheyenne River, Eagle Butte, Native American, Lakota Sioux. We do buffalo 24 head a week. My priority when butchering is quality. If I would eat it, I wouldn't sell it. So I feel good about my skill. Yeah, there it is. Tiffany has now removed her first primal and is headed to her station to get to work. How you doing over there, handsome? I'm gonna make it. I'm 65 years old. I've been cutting meat long before these kids, their mom and dad knew each other. My shop is Tillamook Meat, Inc., entirely family run. My dream is the next couple years to have my boys take this over and go ahead and retire. Matt is working on another popular cut from this first primal, the brisket. One thing I love about the brisket, it has the best fat mm -hmm. on the cow. Well, and also we know that closer to the front of the animal, the fat's gonna be a little sweeter. He might have over cleaned it. Typically, you leave about a quarter inch fat yeah. on top from self base. From here, I can see there's a bunch of gouge marks where he took that fat off when he could have left the fat on and left it nice and clean. I've never cut inside a beef before. I work with my father at his shop. I am excellent with wild game. That's what I specialize in. Compared to a moose or a deer, and it's a bigger animal than what I'm used to. I was watching Chris over here. He's got a little plastic knife sharpening thing. I've never seen anything like that. At the shop, we just call it a mouse trap. Sounds like a mouse trap. If you ever tried this versus a still, it changed your mind and you'll want one of these too. Got the best thing. All four butchers are still cutting up their first primal. Chris is beginning to move all of his meat down to his presentation table. Tyler also heading to his presentation table with a few more cuts. We thought Chris was a little behind. All of a sudden, he drops everything, and he's pulling his second totally primal. Just a totally different strategy and technique. He's just as far along as Tyler is. Tiffany certainly hasn't gotten in a rhythm, and no. to me, just doesn't feel at home with this challenge. Tyler sets his second primal down at the same time Chris moving on to his second primal. 30 minutes down, butchers. Hour and a half left. Completely lost here. 30 minutes down, butchers. Hour and a half left. Tiffany seems uncomfortable. Yeah, she's got good knife skills, but I feel like she's just unfamiliar with this kind of an animal. She's much more comfortable with elk and things of that nature. So I think once she gets past this and she moves to more like rib drop loin, she's really gonna shine. Tyler currently in the lead with nine cuts. Tiffany has two cuts. Tiffany is still on her first primal, while Tyler, Chris, and Matt are on their second. The second primal is the ribbon plate. A skilled butcher can get at least three cuts from this primal. And today, we are focused on what is known as the standing rib roast. How's all my kids doing? Feeling pretty good over here. I got a nice sweat going. How you feeling over there? I'm gonna make it. Yeah, I know you're gonna make it. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler now has a standing rib roast. King of all roasts. Traditional Christmas roast with those seven bones on it. Basically, it's a giant ribeye. Look how he's trying to chine it. This is a move that would typically been on the bandsaw. It's hard to keep a straight line. He's actually doing a great job with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So I've successfully chined the rib roast my first time through, and I'm ecstatic. This little bone scraper gets some of that mix of fat and bone out of there. You don't want to crack your tooth. I am the head butcher at Western Daughters Butcher Shop in Denver, Colorado. In my late 20s, I was starting to fall apart. I was having issues with alcohol and with drugs. Once I started butchering, it gave me a home and it gave me a solid foundation. This is my standing rib roast. You know, judges, it's important to keep in mind, while the butchers are trying to put as many cuts as possible on the table, if they don't meet your standards, they are going to be rejected. Yep. Matt's using the handsaw to take that spine bone off the back of his rib roast, but he just went too deep, and now he's gotten into the eye of the meat with his oh. saw. You're basically just made a butterfly ribeye. You're going to lose money on that. It's also, it's not going to cook properly. Matt has just completely destroyed his rib roast. 
Tiffany moving on to her yes. second primal. She might be able to catch up. The knives that I'm working with, these guys here, have a special meaning to me. These were Tim's. He was a fellow meat cutter that taught me a lot that I know. He uh, passed away last year, so I'm here and following his footsteps. Tyler is way ahead with 12 cuts and now getting to his third primal. The drop loin contains some of the most tender cuts, and a butcher can get as many as nine. Today, the judges are focused on the tri-tip and T-bone. Tri-tip is this great cut that does look like the Star <laughs> Trek logo. If you don't know to look for it, you will cut right through it. There's that seam there, it is right there. Hopefully I didn't cut that tri-tip too much. I think I got it a little too much. I make an incorrect cut, don't follow the right seam, and now I've basically ruined my tri-tip. Son of a bitch. So I am a little frustrated. Matt, manhandling that drop loin, throwing <laughs> it over, flipping it over. Going in for his tri-tip now. The judge is gonna love my tri-tip. I cook hundreds of these monthly. It'll be the best one on the table. The worst injury I've ever had in this business would probably be that I cut a finger off on a saw. And I walked by a tattoo booth. Next thing I knew, I had me a fingernail. <laughs> one hour left. Tiffany's lagging behind a bit, still working on her second primal. Tiffany's cleaning up her skirt steak now. Skirt steak, you have the inside and outside. These are really popular for like fajitas, quick cooking, grilling, beautiful steak. Look at that. Tyler's over here cleaning up his short loin, getting ready to cut his T-bone and porterhouse. All right, it's been a while since I've done this, but we're gonna give it a go. A porterhouse is a T-bone, where a T-bone is not necessarily a porterhouse. It really depends on the size of filet. So if there's not enough filet, it can't be considered a porterhouse. Correct. Typically, you want it at least two inches thick. And they both come from the short loin, right? It's just the porterhouse is cut from the end with more tenderloin. Then you get to the T-bones. Yeah, absolutely. With that T-bone, you've got the filet mignon on one side. You've got a New York steak on the other with a nice bone running through the middle. So you get the flavor from the bone. Great steak. Hand sawing porterhouses can be tricky. Getting the right thickness and having them be consistent is not as easy as it looks. Too thick. We'll see if we can't maybe make another one. There is only a certain amount left on this short loin for correct porterhouses. So at this point, I have to be 100% accurate going forward. There we go. That's borderline porterhouse right there. 30 minutes, butchers. Only 30 minutes remaining. Look at Matt here. He's scoring each steak that he wants. Get you some really nice porterhouse steaks here. A couple of those, a couple T-bones. The T-bones uh, I'm gonna put out today, they're gonna be trimmed to perfection. They're gonna be outstanding. This is the move right here with Matt that you yeah. want to bands off for. It. That's, yeah, a, that's yeah. a tough cut to do. Chris is almost finished with that third prime. Throwing some big old steaks down there. That T-bone. That's Colby's punch. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Now for the big boy. Tyler is now way ahead of the pack and moving on to his final primal. The round is the final primal with the butchers cutting the steamship roast. Ooh, this is one of my favorites right here. Sully, tell me about the steamship. The steamship really gets its name from the cruise lines. You're walking up to a buffet line, this beautiful piece of meat. It was meant to feed a lot of people. It was an inexpensive cut, a lot of flavor. Look at that. Beautiful work. 15 minutes, butchers. She might be able to get some good stuff out of there because it's similar to game. But still going after it. Mm -hmm. She's not giving up. Matt is now moving on to his round. Calling it, guys. I'm gonna keep messing with it. I am done. Tyler is our first butcher to finish. I'm looking at Tyler's table over there. I don't see the T-bone. Oh. What is that on the cart behind Tyler? It looks like he left a T-bone or two back there. Oh. Uh, very critical. He just lost two steaks. A lot of value. A lot of value. What is Matt doing to his steamship? He's almost over trimming. He's been over trimming, in my opinion. He's been trimming fat all day long. You can't get that flavor back. Five minutes, guys. You have five minutes left. I wish I had more time and not feel so pressured. <laughs> Matt is now done. I'm feeling pretty good about the cuts that I put out there today. It is down to Tiffany and Chris. Just a reminder, if these are up to spec as retail cuts, it could be anyone's game. Five, four, three, two, one. 
Time's up. All right, butchers, unfortunately for one of you, this will be your last cut. Please head to the stock room while the judges inspect your work. Here we are at Tyler's presentation table. Tell me what you think about his cuts. I love the flat iron. He's got all the sinew off. Perfect. This would be his tri-tip. There should be a whole nother piece of muscle out here. This is really maybe a third of a tri-tip. He cut his tri-tip off when he broke his round. Is that gonna qualify? That's not a tri-tip. The tri-tip is the one cut that I wasn't very proud of. Where's his T-bone? I don't know why he didn't put it out. Yeah, that could really cost him. He had all that extra time. He was the first one done. I mean, everyone loves a T-bone. Right. All right, guys, here we are at Matt's presentation table, and he has a total of 22 cuts. I'm not worried about nothing. Well, lucky you. Grizzled <laughs> vet. So one of the things I do like is the tri-tip. Leaving that whole piece intact. Do really love that. His rib roast, we trimmed too much, so we've lost all of this goodness right here. That's all flavor. You can't sell this. Looks like it's butterflied. He just went too deep, and now he's gotten into the eye of the meat with oh. his saw. Look at his steamship. Half the leg is gone, so that's not a proper steamship. Let's move on down to Tiffany's table. I didn't get all my cuts out. I'm not feeling good at all. I do like that her bones are even on her rib roast. This looks like her skirt stay. Really nice job here. But looking at this brisket, half of it's gone. She broke the animal too close to the neck. Going after that flat iron, left that seam in. This is the one that should have been split in the middle. Yes. The two pieces. And I've seen worse from people who have been doing this for 30 years. <laughs> yeah. We're at Chris's table. He has a total of 19 cuts. You can really see a difference in the size between your T-bone and your porterhouse. Beautifully done. Look at this brisket. Big gouges. This is not going to cook properly. I could have took more extra time in making sure I did it right. Butchers, you all did great work, but you all had some cuts that were rejected. Only three of you will be moving on to the next round. Butchers, only three of you will move on to the next round. Tyler, after the judges inspected your work, you finished with a total of 18 cuts. Matt, you had a final count of 17 cuts. Congratulations to you both. You're moving on to the next round. You can head back to your blocks. Tiffany and Chris, it is now down to the two of you. Tiffany, you had a final count of six cuts. Chris, you have a final count of 15 cuts. Congratulations, Chris. You're moving on in the competition. You can head back to your station. Tiffany, I can't even imagine what went through your mind when you saw that. I know that this is something that you've never done before. We can tell that you're a really great butcher just by your knife skills and, and your cut work that you did. I think you should be really proud of yourself. Good job, Tiffany. It is now time for you to leave the shop. Thank you. See you guys, good luck. I don't know if there is anything I could have done differently. Maybe I could have came up with a game plan more than I did. But other than that, it was definitely fun, but it was intense. Butchers, you are now one step closer to that $10,000 prize. But there are two more challenges to get through if you're going to bring home the bacon, which is what we're calling this next challenge, because it is all about everybody's favorite food group, bacon. The history of bacon dates back to 1500 BC when the Chinese started curing pork bellies with salt. Fast forward to America in World War II. Bacon grows in popularity because it's relatively cheap. And when Americans are done cooking it, they give the grease back to their butcher who then donates the bacon fat for the war effort. You see, bacon grease can be used to help make incendiary devices and explosives. Today, the average American consumes 18 pounds of bacon per year. A true master butcher should be able to cut to order a piece of meat to the correct weight without a scale. For this challenge, you're each going to head into the meat locker and get a bacon slab. You will race against each other to cut one pound orders of bacon. You're gonna bring it up to Sully, who's gonna weigh it for you. But here's the thing, you don't get to see how much it weighs. If you're over, you'll be able to make trims and try again. But if you're under, it'll be rejected and you have to start over from scratch. Sully's also going to be checking your cuts for quality. You have to cut a total of three one pound orders. But here's the twist. Two of your orders need to be cut by hand. The third order 
you got to use that hand crank flywheel slicer right behind you. Hand crank? Only Matt's old enough to be knowing how to do that. I never ever seen one of them. The first two butchers who successfully cut all three bacon orders will advance to the final round. Very confident with my ability to do one pound hand cuts. It's something I do regularly at work. Let's do this. Ready, set, cut. What is going to be the most difficult aspect of this challenge? Using these flywheel slicers is not something you're going to find in a normal butcher shop. I think it's going to throw them. And cutting that bacon to order and getting those one pounds, that's going to be tough. Tyler and Chris making their way to the slicers. Matt opting to hand slice. This is interesting. Matt's just cutting a bunch. That way, he's going to go up and see if it weighs. And then if he's off, then he's already got some cut. Chris over here, he's got his whole slab. See how it's hanging off the edge? That's creating tension and weight, pulling it away from the blade. I have a feeling it's going to mess up his accuracy. Matt's going to be the first one up to sell it, it looks like. But Tyler making up some ground. And now Chris is back at the block with his first. And Tyler has just passed Matt. He will be the first one up to Sully. Tyler, your slices are under. Those slices will be rejected. He's got to start over. Matt is up with Sully right now, getting his first attempt weighed. Your slices are over. Chris is waiting right behind him. Your slices are under. I got experience breaking down animals and boning out stuff, but I ain't comfortable. I'm nervous. The first two butchers who successfully cut all three bacon orders to the correct weight without a scale will advance to the final round. You have to cut a total of three one pound orders. Two of your orders need to be cut by hand. The third order, you got to use that hand crank flywheel slicer. My first pound, I was over. That's great, because if you're under, you got to cut more. So I peeled off a couple and cut two more as close to the other ones as possible and took it back. Beautiful one pound sliced bacon. Thanks, sir. Well, nicely done. Matt, first one to score. He has done this before. I didn't think anybody had a chance and you know where to get me on the hand cuts. It's so second nature. Tyler's back up. Beautiful one pound sliced Ooh. bacon. There it is. I like that. Come on. And now Tyler can just focus on his cuts by hand. Chris is back up visiting Sully. Chris, you are under. <sighs> so Chris is going back to the slicer for a third time and still not on the board. It's not as easy as you think. With the pressure on and people running up, it gets in your head. Another beautiful one pound. Let's check quality. Beautiful, even slices. Thank you, sir. There it is. This man oh, knows cool. his weight. And now he's going to the slicer. Now, this will be interesting. It's a whole different thing. The slicer that we have to use is something I've never used before. I've seen them, never operated one. I do need to speed up, so I changed my technique. I was doing a more classic slicing, and then I changed to a pistol grip. Interesting technique. I just don't know how he's slicing with just the tip. I have less contact with the blade on the meat, and I'm basically pulling straight through. It does take practice, but after time, you will create straight cuts. Chris is back up. I was choosing to go to the slicer because I thought it'd be easier, but I'm halfway through my bacon, and I don't got one pound up there. Chris, you have a beautiful one pound slice of bacon. There it is. Ooh, Chris on the board. On the board. All Chris right. scores All right, his first pound of bacon. And now he just has his hand cuts left. I finally got my one. I can do this now. Tyler's back up at Sully's station. On Sully. We are over. I'll be right back. I believe that it's faster to shave these cuts and trimming them down until I hit it right on the money. Tyler already back up to the scale. One pound, beautifully. Eight slices. Hell yeah. Bacon. yeah. You're going to get another one, too. Tyler Jeez. evens things up with Chris right behind him with one pound. Matt is back up at Sully. If this is a pound, this competition's over. You're still over. <laughs> this is like playing poker, over and under and over and under. Knowing that I'm over, I went with a vertical cut, the length of the bacon, laid it in there, brought another full slice over the top. No muss, no fuss, looks perfect. 
Man, that's prettier than Oscar Myers. <laughs> <laughs> Can he do it with this? You have one pound of beautifully sliced. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Oh. Matt, our first butcher to move on to the finals. Love my bacon. I didn't want to give up, but I was nervous. I was just trying to hurry up and slice it and just go back up there. Chris, this is one pound of bacon, but we sliced through our paper. The presentation is unacceptable. Oh, so yeah. I should have took it off the paper and cut it. Man, you got to be kidding me. Oh, come on. Tyler just needs one more pound. Chris gonna have to pick up the pace. He needs two pounds. Come on, he said. That was a little bigger than I wanted it to be. Two. You're still over. Over. Oh. We was going like tick for tack, back and forth. Over. Oh. Still over. Both butchers coming in heavy. I was just waiting for Sully to say, you know, you got a pound. You are now over. If this is a pound, this competition's over. <laughs> you have eight beautiful slices of bacon that reaches one pound. There it yes. is. Beautiful. Tyler moving on to the final round. Well played, all three. Good job, youngster. You gotta give Chris credit. He was hustling that. I lost bacon. I think I'm going to be a sausage man now. I ain't going to be baking for a while. That was intense. Chris, I can tell you're a skilled and passionate butcher. This challenge is really a mind screwer. That would have gotten my head so hard. <laughs> it did, it did. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Chris, it is time for you to leave the shop. Going home, probably go back and get a bunch of bacon under my belt so then I can come back and do this competition again. Well, isn't this interesting? New school versus old school. You're both probably wondering what animal is hiding behind this curtain. It is time to meet the invaders. What the hell is that? Well, you're both probably wondering about now what animal is hiding behind this curtain. It is time to meet the invaders. <laughs> what in the hell have they done? Python, nutria, and iguana are all considered invasive species. While none are native to the United States, these animals have wreaked havoc and destruction in the wilds of America. In the Florida Everglades, pythons have been swallowing deer and alligators whole. While the nutria, which was first introduced in California from South America in 1899 for fur trading, they have destroyed large swaths of Louisiana wetlands. Things are so bad there that the state pays hunters who then sell the fur and meat. As for iguanas, pet traders brought them to Puerto Rico in the 1970s from Central and South America, but the population exploded in the wild. Now, iguana meat has become popular for cooking, and they are known as the chicken of the trees. Your business lives and dies on getting the most value out of your animals. The less you waste, the more money you make. For this challenge, you will butcher a python, nutria, and an iguana. There are just a few valuable cuts. You must find them and yield as much value as you can. These are invasive species. The meat isn't worth much in this form, but it's what a master butcher can do with his cuts that adds value. So be creative. I have never butchered anything like this before. I know my gag reflex is gonna be put to the test. In the end, the judges will assess the quality of your cuts, they'll weigh the worthy pieces, and then they'll come up with a total dollar value of your yield. This time around, it isn't just a numbers game. Your quality and creativity will be just as important as quantity in order to create value where ordinary butchers couldn't. You have one hour and 45 minutes to complete this challenge. The butcher who has the highest overall value gonna win it all. Let's do this. Ready, set, cut! What are the keys to getting a good yield from that python? Being very careful, skinning it, making sure you don't damage any of that meat. 
And then when you're breaking that down, keeping that knife really close to those bones and trying to peel off as much meat as you can. Matt has started around the neck so it'll come off whole, whereas Tyler is starting to field dress it first. Strategy on this python is to get the hide off as fast as I can, get him gutted, and get him to my table. Oh, it just sprayed me in the face. That was gross. Matt's using every square inch of the meat <laughs> locker, backing himself into the corner, trying to pull the last bit of skin off the tail. I look over at Matt. I'm going to take this technique from him, and I'm going to beat him. Tyler using the same technique to finish skinning his 10-foot python, and it's off. <laughs> Tyler actually has a tattoo of a badger fighting a cobra. <laughs> the meaning of that is to remind me to be the badger and not the cobra. The cobra is my weaknesses. He is literally <laughs> fighting a snake right now. Snakes are one of the few animals you actually skin first and then cut back and gut to keep that nice tight shape, pulling that skin off. And you have to be very careful, because if you go in too deep, you rupture the inside, which could contaminate your meat. Oh, that smells delicious. Ugh, that's not going to add any value to your table. The Badger Butcher, making quick work of his 10-foot python. Oh, that is a bad choice. Now Matt makes his way out of the meat locker. On a snake this big, is the quality of meat the same from head to tail? Yes, it's pretty much the same. I'm going to be interested to see how creative they're able to get. There's no way I'm going to be able to fillet a 15-foot python, but a 2-foot python was almost similar to a sea bass, and I fillet those all the time. I have no idea what I'm doing. So most of the things I'm going to do on this uh, python is going to be just creative. I'm just going to uh, try to get the most different items. Matt is doing some extremely thin cuts there. I start to fillet the snake. That white surface had to come off because it's too tough. Tyler's having a very difficult time skinning this mm -hmm. because he's coming at it from the wrong angle. You have to hold it flat, otherwise you'll cut right through the skin and you'll get the pieces that yeah. you can't use. We are 30 minutes into this challenge. Matt, he's happy with those pieces, laying them down. These are uh, the equivalent of loin fillet steaks. This tail meat, it is a lot tougher than I previously thought it was. I'm just going to do, it's kind of like brajoule. You take your cheaper cuts, tie them up real nice, and do some kind of braise. They still got a nutrient and iguana to do. And don't forget, they have to skin that nutrient. Oh. Time management will become a consideration here real quick. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here you go, the medallion's right here. Beautiful. So he's got them tied up. This is that creativity that I yeah. wanted to see. Now that actually looks good to me. Think of the difference of having huge, long pieces of what you can't tell versus something that looks like you could pan fry it. It's a yeah, pinwheel. Absolutely. It'd be delicious. Mm -hmm. This python wraps around stuff. So that's where I got the idea. And I made a few nuts, thinking it might look pretty cool. Matt, moving down to his presentation yeah. table. Tyler also moving down to his presentation table. As I put my cuts out, out of the corner of my eye, I see that Matt has a tremendous amount of yield. And I decided to go back to my table, round up my trim bucket, and put them onto my stew meat. That stew meat, great example. Just take what I can up, dice it up, just pounds on the table. Absolutely, and I think Tyler would have been on the Nutria if he did not see Matt put up all of that stuff. I don't have time to inspect this meat, so I decided to put it down and just keep going. Matt, coming out with animal number two, Nutria, the river rat. I'm going to look at this Nutria like I would a rabbit. OK, bunny, bunny, bunny. Oh, this thing is nasty. This animal stinks to high hell. Ho, 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 ho. The butcher who has the highest overall value going to win it all. Ho, ho my gag reflex is going to be put to the test when I'm butchering this thing. You getting that smell right there? Whew. Nutrients, we have them all over where I live. This is just going to be like a rabbit. Matt is able to successfully remove the pelt while I'm still making mistakes as I go. What is that? What would you be going for? The hind legs for things that walk with their back legs a lot. That's a great piece of meat. The meat is a little more on the tough side, so I'm going to make sausage with that. He's going after the back fat. You're making sausage right now? Are you nuts? <laughs> Just for you. This meat is so lean. If you're going to make a sausage, you've got to have fat to bind it and to give it flavor. 
how much value does that add? If you turn it into sausage, something that's like prepared, ready to go, you can charge much more for it. You know, upwards $13, $15 a pound. Clock is ticking, butchers. You're down to your last 15 minutes. At this point, I'm really starting to feel the pressure. We're uh, sticking with our Italian roots here. We are doing Nutria Brajul. This is a rolled and boned flank. Tyler's definitely not as much volume, but more fine cuts and stuff. Matt's old school butcher shop, two different styles. I wanted to show attention to detail. Matt now with his third and final animal, the iguana. Boy, that hide is tough. It'll be interesting to see their creativity come out. Iguana, I know the tail has meat. It has muscles running along the vertebrae. Its arms and its legs are basically going to be frog legs. They got little bones in here that ain't got no reason to be there. It doesn't really smell bad. It smells kind of good. You're down to your last five minutes. I gotta find out what value cuts I'm gonna get off this thing. There's just not a lot. Matt is trying to get every ounce of that meat. Boom. Oh, oh Looks like Tyler just ripped his tail in half trying to skin it. <laughs> I just did what I shouldn't have done. I've got a piece of tail and a very large chunk of meat that I need. <laughs> 10 seconds, nine, eight, seven. A lot of scraps six. over here. Five, four, what do you got going on over three, there? Three, two, one. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> How about that now? Butchers, please head back to the stock room while the judges determine the overall value of your work. Let's take a look at their cuts, shall we? Yep. Absolutely. Sure. The toughest part about that python was figuring out is all of that meat the same thing? If it's like a rattlesnake. Yeah. It's all one thing. In the end, butchering is also about eating. In a final twist in this competition, Roxanne will cook two cuts of meat. So, Roxanne, which cuts are you going to put on the grill? When we think about grilling, right, we think about doing things that can cook quickly. So I want to take the Nutria loins from each of the guys and see how they cook up. Perfect. If either doesn't cook well, it will be rejected and its value lost. We'll see you in a bit. OK, sounds good. Have fun. Let's talk about Matt. What do you think of his yield? I really like his rosettes here. It's really pretty, great presentation. This is going to cook really nice. Absolutely love the sausage. He purposely put it in that small sheet casing. Perfect choice. But looking at his name, skewer meat is not going to skewer really well. And this dark meat, that's kind of like a blood vein. It's going to be really gamey. I can already tell that Tyler's pieces are cooking up more evenly than Matt's are. This guy is already kind of springy and tough. What you think of Tyler's table here? I do love the attention to detail on these fillet portions. Trimmed them up really nice. But on this stew meat, there's still a lot of sinew in here, and there's a bit of bone mm -hmm. right there. On the iguana, I could tell he was having a little trouble with the skinning, but I would like to see a little bit more detail. For instance, these legs. I would have loved to see something creative out of him, separating these, pulling this meat back, making almost like iguana lollipops. Mm. You know, just something fun. We can take less valued meats and make the most money. Tyler's Nutria actually cooked up pretty nicely, so let's give it a shot. And then we've got Matt's loin. Tyler's Nutria loin definitely has a better tenderness. Matt's is grainier and more sinewy. When he was breaking it down, there was a bit of an issue there with how he cut it. I'm going to have to reject Matt's cut. I feel really good. Told my wife and kids, I'm not coming home if I don't win. Nobody remembers second place. I need to win this competition. I need people to know that my passion for butchery changed my life. I'm happy to have you. Well, you're, you're, you're a good kid. I love you. Judges. Have you weighed the meat and determined which butcher has the highest value? We have. Let's bring the butchers back in. Matt, your 46 years of experience really showed and got a lot of meat from those invaders. Tyler, for seven years of experience, you attack this like somebody with 30 years under your belt. Matt, your final value, $536.07. Tyler, your value, $514.57. Matt, congratulations. Well done. Tyler, 
round by round, you showed us what you were made of. But unfortunately, we found some cartilage in some of your stew meat. I saw your eyes look over at Matt, and you went back to that table, and that's what really cost you. It was an honor watching you cut meat. Thank you. Tyler, it is time for you to leave the shop. Thank you. We do need $10,000, but to have the respect of three prolific judges is worth $100,000 to me. Well, congratulations, Matt. <laughs> you just won $10,000, and you are the butcher champion. How you feeling, brother? I've been at this game a long time. It's been a long rodeo. This might be just a little validation for me. There's only so many more miles to the sunset. Matt, you're gonna ride off into the sunset with a bag full of $10,000. I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. I really feel good. I feel proud. Can't wait to go home, tell my wife and kids. Me and mom are gonna go on vacation. <laughs> history, the butcher has been a linchpin to survival. In early civilizations, when foodborne diseases were claiming lives, it was the butcher, with their sharp tools and sharper skills, who kept death at bay. Across centuries, butchers were as highly regarded as doctors, and eventually became a fixture in nearly every town across America. Today, there are thousands of people who cut meat, but only a select few with the expertise to call themselves Master Butcher. Tonight, in three escalating rounds to test speed and precision. This one is too long. Four of America's best butchers will battle it out for prize money and pride, culminating in a final challenge against a surprise beast. Hell yeah. Right here on The Butcher. I'm Johnny, I've been a butcher for 33 years. I believe I am the best butcher in the nation. When you got someone like me saying that I'm the best and I'm ready to back it up by putting my check down, I'll send you home broke. I'm Sean, I'm a butcher and I'm a painter. I get a painting buzz when I'm cutting meat. I get some sort of creative satisfaction out of that. You know, those are the things that really have made me who I am. My name's Penny. Before becoming a butcher, I was a restaurant chef, and I'd been a butcher for 11 years. And I'd been just getting fired up about it, and I'd always loved doing it. I believe strongly. Figure out what you're passionate about and go do it, and who cares what anyone says? Go for it. My name's Randy. I'm from Hot Springs, Arkansas. I consider myself a master butcher, and I take pride in that. I take pride in being my community's butcher. That's what I live for. It's my life. Welcome to the shop. Tonight, we will be putting you through three rounds of competition specifically designed to push your skills to the absolute limit. In the end, only one of you will prove that you have what it takes to walk out of here with $10,000 and the title of Butcher Champion. Next to me are three experts in your craft. They're master butchers in their own right, but more importantly, they are your judges. He's the man that even the best butchers in the country call when they've got questions. It's the Reverend of Fat, Michael Sully Sullivan. She earned degrees in environmental biology, zoology, as well as fisheries and wildlife before becoming an accomplished chef who also hunts and butchers whole animals, Miss Roxanne Spruance. And finally, down there on the end, with over 30 years of experience, he's worked in San Francisco's best butcher shops, including his own, Dave the Butcher Budworth. I look up at the judges and I'm like, wow, they're like the most famous butchers. This is gonna be tough. For this challenge, we've got something big in store for you. And that's not a word we throw around lightly. You ready to see what's on your dance card tonight? Turn around, take a peek into the meat locker. All right, boys, hit the switch. Bison. Yeah. I look into the cooler and I was just like, holy sh there's a bison. Weighing upwards of 2,000 pounds, the American bison is the largest land animal in North America. For centuries, they were an important resource for Native Americans, who utilized almost every square inch of the animal to make everything from weapons to medication to clothing. But in the 1800s, settlers slaughtered more than 50 million bison and nearly hunted them out of existence. In 1905, Teddy Roosevelt formed the American Bison Society 
to help save them from extinction. Today, the American bison has made such a resurgence that it's a popular choice in butcher shops, supermarkets, and restaurants all across the country. Working from the rail, you will break down your beef into sections, what you butchers call primals. The chuck and shoulder, rib and plate, drop loin, and round. You will then cut each of those primals into as many retail cuts as possible. Now, as if breaking down this massive side of meat isn't challenging enough, we're gonna throw in a little twist. You're gonna have to do it with one of these, a tomahawk. Oh, <laughs> oh, I've never used a tomahawk to process meat. This is not a walk in the park. This is a challenge. The tomahawk is a single-handed ax created by the Algonquin Indians. While used primarily as a weapon or as a tool for chopping, tomahawks were also utilized to skin animals like the bison. You will have access to all the tools and equipment in the shop, most importantly, once you get past this. You will have one hour and 45 minutes for this monumental challenge. So speed is definitely important, but so is skill and precision. Any of your cuts that do not meet the judge's standards will be rejected. And so will the butcher with the least amount of cuts. All right, butchers, head into the meat locker, grab your tomahawks, and choose your bison. So this will be interesting seeing what they do with the tomahawk and what their first point of attack is to get into that thing. It's game time. It's time to let it fly. All right, butchers, on my go. Three, two, one, cut! How difficult is it to break down a bison? The size alone makes it tough. If you're comparing it to a side of beef, I think it's actually a little bit tougher because the meat is super lean. The leaner a meat is, the looser it's going to be because there's not any of that fat to kind of hold it together. So that makes this more difficult than just breaking down a side of cattle. This is definitely the strangest thing I've ever had to use to break down a carcass. Looking at Sean, man, yeah. going quick work. I mean, yeah, I like his technique. His hand's almost at the head mm -hmm. of the tomahawk. It's smart. A lot more control that way. Right now I'm looking at it like, oh boy. The length of this blade, the way that the handle is on this blade, I'm just trying to like not make huge cut mistakes. With that tomahawk, she's trying to be really clean with it, but you know, it is a time challenge. So hopefully she's not wasting too much time there. She could be doing more work on the inside than we can see. All right. Randy already has his primal. Johnny coming out now. What would your approach be once you get it onto your block? Take that brisket off. Remove that arm, start getting it to manageable pieces. A skilled butcher can get at least three cuts from chuck and shoulder. We are focused on what is known as the brisket. The brisket is, is a breast muscle. I would start with the brisket and get that out of the way. What are you looking for when they remove the brisket here? What we want to see is that brisket left hold and we're also going to remove the duckle. What exactly is that duckle? There's just another muscle that goes uh, right along the top, and there's a huge chunk of fat that goes underneath it. So when you braise it, it really just like renders that whole thing out. I just pull the brisket out, pull the duckle muscle off, and I cut it into two pieces. Looks like Johnny split his brisket. Or did he put the duckle out? I'm not sure why he says two pieces. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> They only want one piece. I knew for sure that's not what the judges are looking for. Ooh, made a mistake. I flipped the brisket and I noticed that I put a huge gash in it. That was kind of a kick in the pants. So I tell myself, I'm just gonna keep cutting. In a small mom and pop butcher shop, you can't waste your time crying over spilt milk. It happens. I work at Salem Prime Cuts, Salem, Connecticut. Aside from butchery, I like to paint. Most of my subject matter deals with what I see in my everyday life, which is meat processing. Painting in and of itself is not art. It's a craft, and the same thing applies to butchery. And by perfecting the, the craft, you touch upon art. You know, those are the things that it's really important to me. Sean put his brisket out. He's moving quick. You make it look pretty. I don't want this on this brisket. I own Griffith's Custom Butchering in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Met my wife, went out to her dad's shop one day, and I started helping him out. And I absolutely fell in love with butchering. I worked alongside my father-in-law for 10 years. Now me and his daughter are running the show. Look over here at Randy, look at that brisket. 
Already got it cleaned off, got the bone off. Beautiful. Yeah, Absolutely nice work. beautiful. Penny is still in the meat locker trying to remove yeah. that first primal. Penny oh. has broken a little low and is rocking her way through the scapula now. That's unfortunate. No, you're not going to be able to get through that scapula with that tomahawk. Missing that first cut is crucial because you got mm. so much more you got to cut through to be able to make that separation break. 30 minutes down, butchers. I'm sort of in my head now because everybody else has left the cooler for a long, long time. But I don't give up. You know, the longer she's in there, the more it's going to get in her head how far behind she's yeah. getting. I'm not going out like this. All right, Penny, get it, girl. Johnny, Randy, and Sean are moving on to their second primal, while Penny is still working on her first primal. Penny has now removed that shoulder. OK. I've got the primal on the table, and the first thing I want to do is take the brisket off. I'm just trying to seam it out so that I can get to the cuts that I need. Sean is now working on his second primal. A master butcher should be able to get five cuts from the rib and plate primal. Today, we are focusing on the tomahawk steaks. Tomahawk is such an iconic cut, basically a bone and ribeye, but we leave that bone super long. When you cook it, it's just this neat and pristine white bone. Johnny now working on his second primal. I'm a master butcher in Los Angeles, California. I became a butcher back in 85. I am the first butcher in my family. My daughter's coming up as a second person. Passing along the skills of my daughter is one of the most important parts of my whole life. Butchers, one hour remaining. Look at Sean, scored each bone, that membrane. Yep. I mean, I love the technique. If you get right underneath it, pull it off with your hook, it gives you a nice white clean bone. This is my bone and hook that I use for scoring bone skin. That's just a wonderful tool. Now we see Johnny. So he's cutting him right in the middle. So he's, so he's, he's he lost they his will tomahawk. not be tomahawk. Man. Huge mistake. You know, if this was a cow, that would be the size of a tomahawk. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for bison tomahawks. Issues that I'm having right now with the tomahawk steaks, I'm trying to make the bones clean. I'm trying to pretty this ugly tomahawk steak up. It's the ugliest one I got. It's harder to clean with the consistency of that bison. Penny's cleaning her brisket, and while it is smaller because of where she broke it, it does look good. I have faith in Penny, guys. I am one of the co-owners of Saucy Son. It is an artisan butcher shop in Cleveland. We bring in whole animals from small family farms. We try to really respect the whole thing and make sure that every bit of it gets used because it is a life and hopefully it had a good one. Butchers, 45 minutes remaining. Penny's thrown her brisket down. One of the most beautiful briskets I've seen today. Penny now gonna head back into the meat locker. She's going for her second primal. Sean, Johnny, and Randy are all tied with four cuts and have finished their second primal, while Penny is in last place with one cut. Sean with his third primal. The drop loin can have as many as five cuts. Today, we're focusing on the tenderloin. But what I'm looking for with that is, does he get that silver skin off without gouging through or losing a lot of meat? Look at how much meat Randy is pulling off while he's cleaning it up. Yeah, I mean, when you're taking that silver skin, you really got to come under it and make nice, even stroke with your knife pointing up to the silver skin and not into the meat. Yeah, and we see Johnny cleaning all his tenderloin. That's what you want to see, really tight on that so that you have the most yield for your meat. Randy's over here tying up his tenderloin. Why are tying skills important to a butcher? A lot of times you're tying leaner meat that's kind of flopping around that you want to have it be a little bit tighter, which is going to aid in the cooking process. It looks like he almost just folded it right in half. Which is also unfortunate, too, because the whole point of folding it under is so that you have it be an even diameter so yeah. that it cooks evenly. Yeah, that's not going to cook evenly at all. Penny is struggling to get her second primal of bison. Well, an hour and 45 minutes is a long time. This is a huge animal. Well, I think she's kind of gotten lost. I'm tired. It's taking me a very long time to get this done. OK, Sean is now working on his final primal, the round. We got five cuts in there. Today, we're focusing on the London broil and the shank. I've got to pull the London broil off of the round to cut some London roll steaks. I need to make these look pretty, but I also have to get them done. Look how much meat he has taken off mm. again. You're losing value, but he squared it off nice. It'll cook up well. Sean is working that shank. This is a thing that we typically we would take and braise long and slow. 
I'm not worried about what the other competitors are doing. He's like scurrying everywhere. If I start to worry about all of this other distraction, then I'm gonna choke. He's racing against himself right now. Yep. I work fast. Boom, crank him out. He does have some pieces that aren't trimmed all the way around, yeah. and I probably would have gone back through and trimmed a little bit. Butchers, 15 minutes remaining. About 20 years ago, I was cutting pork sticks on a bandsaw. Knocked my finger right off from the center, cut it all the way down to the last 10 and dangling. My worst injury that I've ever had. It's something you remember and see every day, so you always remember what not to do. Penny is now out of the cooler. I finally got the freaking second primal off. It's time to roll, girl. <laughs> I'm not gonna pay too much attention it's about time and just get that freaking tomahawk cut. Five minutes remaining, butchers. He's on the saw. My main concern is getting to that bandsaw and slicing these shank steaks, but Johnny's on the bandsaw. I have no choice but to grab my handsaw. Hey, look at him struggling. Johnny's on the saw. True. So, I mean, what's your choice? Yeah. I mean, you got a hand cut. You're yeah. out of time. Two minutes remaining, butchers. Looks like Penny is uh, cleaning her tomahawk. tomahawk. All right, Losike Sean is has done. completed. I'm feeling pretty good because I know I finished the challenge with time to spare. Does Johnny have enough time to lay those down? 10 seconds. Before the time Nine, runs out. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, time. I'm pissed. I wanted to get my shank sinks finished. Uh, I couldn't. I needed that bandsaw. Great job, butchers. Unfortunately for one of you, this will be your last cut. Remember, any of your cuts that do not meet the judge's standards will be rejected. Please head to the stock room while the judges inspect your work. That was the toughest thing I've probably ever uh -huh. done. A hatchet with a bison. Uh -huh. Okay, judges, here we are at Sean's display. Tell me what you think about his cuts. These are just absolutely beautiful tomahawks. I love how clean these bones are, how white this is gonna be when you grill it. The cartilage on here would have preferred a clean bone yeah. on that, but these are just absolutely beautiful. On his brisket, he pulled the whole thing, but kind of made a bracelet out of it. I wouldn't put that in my case. The hind shanks here, I would have trimmed a little bit more of this off. There's a lot of hair on here still. Next stop, Johnny's table. His shanks, these are gonna cook beautiful. He made time to finish these up. This is a nice size portion, absolutely beautiful. He ended up cutting his brisket in half. Other than that, it would have been a beautiful brisket. These tomahawks, this isn't really a true tomahawk. A tomahawk goes all the way down to that cartilage. Mm -hmm. So he's cutting them right in the middle. That's a huge mistake right there. To me, it's not a tomahawk. This is Penny's presentation table here. Out of all the butchers, she had the hardest time using that tomahawk. Yeah, she's obviously a really skilled butcher, but I think she just got lost in that shoulder. But gallant effort for sure. These are beautiful steaks right here. For you know what she got out on the plate, it, it's really nice work. Look at this brisket. It's the prettiest one we've seen. Really nice and cleaned up. Really, really pretty. This is Penny's tomahawk. I really like that she kept at it. I just wanted one tomahawk steak. It was a very valiant effort to, yeah. to kind of get that out. Absolutely. This is Randy's presentation table. His tomahawks, they're not real clean on the bone, and they're not even in the meat side here. Clean the bone up? That was the hardest part for me. His London broils are really nice, trim nice. He does tend to, like, kind of over trim, but he took the entire tenderloin and folded it in half. Normally what would be done is just this tail part would be tucked under, so the, this roast would be a lot longer and even. I've never seen this in all my years of a tenderloin being folded like that. Mm -mm. Okay, judges, have you made your decision? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, let's bring the butchers back in. Good. See how it goes. We'll leave it on the table, no hard feelings, right, guys? No. Nope. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck, man. Hey, guys. Butchers, you battled hard through this massive side of meat, but in the end, only three of you will move on to the next battle. After counting and inspecting all of your cuts, we have a tie for the highest number, which is 11 cuts. All of you had some cuts rejected by the judges, but Sean, Randy, congratulations. You are moving on in this challenge. You can both head back to your blocks. Nice work. Johnny, Penny, the butcher going home is Johnny, 
Penny, it is down to the both of you. Johnny, you were right behind them. You ended up with 10 cuts in this challenge. Penny, you ended up with three cuts. Johnny, congratulations, you're moving on. You can head back to your workstation. Penny, I know that this was your first bison and your first time with the tomahawk. I know that it's super tough. I really just appreciated your tenacity and really just kind of trying to push through. We can tell that you have great knife skills. I think that this bison just kind of got the best of you today. Penny, please exit the shop. Thank you guys so much. This was a really cool experience. I didn't want to get kicked off in the first challenge, but I'm proud of myself for attacking this bison. I fought hard and I didn't give up. Then there were three, which brings us to our next challenge. We call it Speed Links. And yes, I'm talking about sausage. One of history's most universal foods, sausage has been on the menu for over 4,000 years. Ancient writings from Mesopotamia speak of dishes that include meat stuffed in animal intestine casings. According to the book, Sausage, A Global History, it was the rise of coordinated hunting and bigger game that helped fuel its popularity. Nearly every civilization has evolved the sausage. Today in America, there are an estimated 200 varieties for sale in butcher cases around the country. On each of your blocks, you have a grinder and a stuffer. Your challenge is to make six individual sausages that are exactly six inches in length from a pork shoulder and belly. Any experienced master butcher should be able to do this solely by eye and feel. For that reason, you will not be able to use a ruler. This is gonna be deceptively difficult. I got this. I do tons of sausage. I think I got an edge on both of them. You'll present your links to Sully. He will measure and inspect the quality. Each link that is too long, too short, or does not pass the quality check will be rejected. The first two butchers to deliver six perfect sausage links will move on. Ready, set, cut. As soon as Kobe said go, I thought I should get everything set up on my table and then go get the meat. Randy opting to do a little prep work before he goes to get his pork, huh? You I like love that, that strategy. Yeah. Set yourself up for success. Johnny and Sean are back with their pork. How should they be prepping their meat? Skin the belly, skin the shoulders, bone them out. You want to cut the meat into strips so that the worm will grab it. If you cut it into cubes, it's just going to bounce around in there, create friction, heat up your meat, and you're going to get a mushy product. My first thing would be to get my meat and grind probably more than I think, because then when my sausage don't pass muster, I can just come back and make more sausage. The grinding's gonna take you more time. Every butcher needs to know how to make sausage. You have to take your lesser quality meat and trimmings and grind it up, stuff it, and make good money on it. I'm gonna take it all to my block. It's all right in front of me. No more trips to the cooler. I cut it in strips. I like strips because it, it'll grab a hold, it'll pull through. I don't have to plunge it as much. I feed the meat through, being careful not to jam up the machine. I'm listening to the motor, listen to it strain. You gotta let the grinder do the work. What's the purpose of adding salt to your grind? It's gonna really help pull some of the liquid out of the meat okay. that can help bind your meat and your fat together. Dave, what all can go wrong during this process? One can be a blowout, which means the pressure of the meat is gonna break through the casing, which then you're gonna have to cut that off and start over again. You've gotta have your hand on that tube and you're cranking the sausage out and you're controlling the rate of how that sausage casing is coming off the tube as the meat fills it. Tears in the casing, too much air pockets in it. Johnny now placing his links on his presentation tray. To do six sausages, it should take me 20 minutes or so. I got this. Let's check it out. Johnny, first one, going to head up to Sully, get his six sausage links inspected. This sausage is too long. Ooh. This one is also long. Second one's too long. Third one's too long. My bubble got popped just a little bit. Johnny, all your sausages are too long. Sully tells Johnny, head back and try again. Randy turning the crank on his sausage stuffer. Oh, Randy just had a blowout on his sausage. Well, I have a blowout, and I think, there, that's my luck. This is gonna hurt my time. Come on, Randy. Together, man. The first two butchers to deliver six sausage links exactly six inches in length will move on. Randy making his first trip up to Sully. 
It looks like Johnny did have to go back and run some more through the stuffer, but no, he's got all six. He's ready. The sausage is too long. Said no wife ever. <laughs> <laughs> and now Sean's gonna join him. Also too long. Randy looks so nervous. Also too long. Come on, Sully. Too long, and one other thing, watch our air pockets. Yes, sir. He didn't accept any of them. OK, we'll, we'll do it again. We'll try to make Sully happy. Johnny now steps back up. Beautiful six-inch sausage. Oh. oh my God. This sausage is short. This sausage is long. There's a lot of variables to make a sausage. Is the meat going to be cold enough? If the meat's too warm, it really starts to smear, and it just creates a horrible product. Another. Beautiful six inch sausage. Oh, Johnny's got two on the board. Looking for four more. How you feeling? Okay. Oh, Sean making his first trip up to Sully. Your first sausage is in. Ooh. Six oh, six yes. Sean's right on That's the money. That's impressive. So your second is short. Sean, you have another sausage oh. that is in. Sean is tied with Johnny. Both men need four more. We're tied. I need to get this going right now. The first sausage is short. Your second sausage is in. Oh, Johnny. This is also in. Beautiful sausage. Johnny now only needs two more. Randy's in line right behind him. This one is also in. Oh. Oh, see. Johnny. Still needing one more. Randy stepping up to Sully's see station. See if you can get on the board, huh? This one is in. Okay. There you go. Randy getting his first sausage link on the board. This sausage is too short. Randy, you have made the proper link, but unfortunately, I will have to reject this because you have excessive air bubbles throughout this sausage. I'm really feeling the pressure now, but uh, I will succeed because of my will. I don't have stop. I, I go. Randy hoping to get one more point on the board with this final sausage length. Randy, this sausage is the correct length. And this is acceptable. Randy ties up Sean. Sean, this sausage is the proper length. There you go. Oh. Randy now steps back up. Surely these four are on the money. Randy, this one is also too short. I don't want to punch all the wall. Come on up, Johnny. I'm up at Sully. I'm holding my breath. Johnny, congratulations. You're the first to first complete. Time. Beautiful sauce. Oh, there it is. Johnny, the first butcher moving into the final round. $10,000 is going to be mine. Sean heading back up. OK, Sean. I know I have to pick up the pace. That's a showdown between me and Randy. Sean, you have another sausage. Sean needs two more. Randy's coming up right behind him. He needs four more. Sean, you have another sausage oh. that is of length. I'm one sausage away from ending this challenge. Sean, this one is too long. Mm. Randy, this is the correct size. Randy puts another one on the scoreboard. This is also six inches. Mm. Congratulations. Oh. Randy right. now has four qualified sausage links. Wow. He only needs two more. Okay. Sean only needs one more. Sean now headed back up. It's too long. Sean's too long. He's running back with his tray. Randy's heading to Sully. This is approved. Oh. There you go. Randy has yeah. now tied up this competition. Now we see some people running. Unfortunately, this is too short. Oh, two. that one's too short. Randy oh. working the stuffer over there, trying to produce some <laughs> sausage. Sean already has another one ready to go. Sean, congratulations. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man. yeah. Sean snatches victory. It's a tidal wave of relief, and it's a good feeling. I made it to the final challenge. It's very gut-wrenching. It hurts your pride. It makes you just wish you had that one more shot. Nice job, butchers. Randy, unfortunately, you will not be moving on in the competition. Randy, some of your sausages I had to reject because of excessive amount of air bubbles. Unfortunately, it's going to be time for you to go home today. I came here because I wanted the title, and now I have to walk away without that. And that's the hardest part of this for me, being told that you got to go home because you had this tough sausage. <sighs> tough to swallow. I don't cut meat with anybody, man. There ain't a bigger, better problem. Congratulations, Johnny and Sean. The first two challenges were tough. 
but I can guarantee you they were nothing compared to what's coming at you from behind this curtain. Gentlemen, it is time to get weird. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, it is time to get weird. The ostrich. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Something I never even dreamed of cutting. Hitting heights as tall as nine feet and tipping the scales upwards of 320 pounds, it is the biggest bird of them all. And while it can't fly, the ostrich can run like the wind, up to 40 miles per hour, faster than any animal on two legs. If attacked, the ostrich is strong enough to kill a lion with one kick. Native to Africa, Ostriches here in America were mostly farmed for their skin to make leather. But in the 1980s, when people started to become more health conscious, the market for ostrich meat started to take off as an alternative to beef. Ostrich is like gold. Even ground meat can sell for more than $15 a pound. But in the hands of the right butcher, more than $20 a pound. For this challenge, you are to yield as much meat from your ostrich as possible. Using your skills as master butchers, create quality retail cuts. In the end, the judges will assess the superiority of your cuts, weigh the worthy pieces, and then add up the total dollar value of your yield. Remember, butchers, creativity increases your cut's value. The butcher that is able to produce the highest value is going to leave here with the title of butcher champion and be $10,000 richer. You have two hours and 30 minutes to complete this challenge. Ready? Set, cut. First order of business, they got to skin these birds, right? Yeah. Their skin is super, super tough. Start with the legs, cut around, and just start peeling it all the way down. Once you get that skin off, it's going to be like a treasure hunt, trying to look for groupings of muscles. My strategy is to skin the ostrich the same way I would a deer. Taking the skin off the ostrich, it's second nature. The skin is rubbery. I can't leave it on the way I would with a chicken or a turkey. The body is like a really thick turkey skin that's dry. It's a little tight. As I got a big portion loose, it comes right off like a shirt. Sean yeah. using his forearm. He's over halfway through <laughs> skinning his ostrich. I'm punching it out. You don't really use the knife to skin an animal as much as most people would think. I look at Sean, and I notice he has the whole thing pulled off like a cheap suit. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> Sean, first butcher coming out of the meat locker with his ostrich. I get the ostrich over to my block. I'm approaching it using my knowledge of a chicken or a turkey. Unlike a chicken or a turkey, they don't really have breast meat, do they? None. No. So in an ostrich, we have the tenderloin. It's a fan muscle. Also, the oyster steak located near the back. You know, and it'll be interesting to see like how their creativity comes out. If you don't know what you're doing, seam it out taking everything off that carcass, pulling out different muscles. I don't even know what they were called. You want to be very careful and make sure you get those seams where those natural separations of the muscles happen. Sean's come in on his joint, and he's pulling that whole leg up. Right now, I'm just going to break it down into its main primals, decide which meat I'm going to use based upon tenderness. It's like cow meat. So I got a pile of boneless meat already. I'm feeling texture, I'm pushing on the grains a little bit to see what's tender, what's not. The texture is like beef, so I'm going with it. See that dark piece of meat? That's that tenderloin. He just set it to the side. Let's see how he finishes this up. I mean, it looks like Sean's just going through everything and just getting all the silver skins out. Looks like Johnny may be making some stew meat over here. Which is another great way of using tough cuts. Sean making thin slice. It looks like he's doing some kind of cutlets, yeah. Now I'm taking this thigh, and I notice that there's some really nice big pieces. They resemble top rounds. He's feeling the meat to see like how tough it would be and what he should do with it. These parts, I did a little field test on them. I would mark them as ostrich tenderloins. You're 30 minutes into this challenge. Two hours remain. There's my I love it. <laughs> Give me that cleaver. So I'm doing some scallopini. Scallopini is basically a real thin steak cutlet. I do a lot of veal scallopini in my shop. So here goes Sean, loading some of that ostrich meat. It's time to start making some ground ostrich meat. I like to make little florets. I catch it as it comes out. 
apply a little pressure and then pull it off. And they look nice. If it's just ground lean, you're gonna want to compress it a little bit, otherwise it's just gonna turn into crumble. Mm -hmm. The little bits that he did really lean, it you know, represented of like a lean hamburger. Right. Sean heading back into the meat locker, gonna get some of that pork belly. It's time for me to start making some sausage, make a value-added product. Sean has mixed some of that pork in. You gotta have that fat to bind it and to give it flavor. The great thing about making sausage, you take a product that's really hard to cook, you grind it, it becomes tender, and you just increase the value of that product three to four times. And it really showcases the true craft and art of a butcher. Oh, looks like we got some medallions over here. I have some steaks, which look like a tenderloin to me. I'm trying to utilize everything into a retail aspect. A little oyster steak. Looks like Johnny's found the oyster steak. Just like other birds, there are two oyster steaks in here. And that's that back lumbar area of the bird where the hips are in there. You can, you can pop it out behind the thighs on a chicken. We call it an oyster steak because the webs of fat running along the cut make it resemble an oyster shell. It looks like Sean's gonna be making pinwheels with his cutlets with a layer of sausage. You take a tender piece of meat that you're getting maximum dollars for, mm -hmm. and you're taking meat that you don't get as much value, but now you can sell it for maximum value. Oh. Very smart. Johnny's got a lot of stuff on the table. My concern was that I didn't really see him trying to figure out what to do with stuff. We don't want to just see the same thing over and over again. We're going to want to see yeah. creativity. Butchers, you are now halfway through this challenge. 75 minutes remain. I look over to Sean, and I notice he's got a variety of different cuts. I'm just like, wow, it's going to be tough. I think he can give me a lot of trouble. Now it's time to get the game face on and get rolling. I still want to get rid of some of this sausage meat, so I decided to make a boneless thigh cushion stuffed with sausage. If you take an entire chicken and grind it, stuff it back into the skin, tie it up, and then you roast it like that. This is that creativity that I yeah. wanted to see. One hour remaining, butchers. I'm kind of curious where this might go. A oh, double grind. A double grind. I know you like to see that. I do a double grind in my shop. Just makes a better ground beef. Makes it look better. It mixes better. More consistent. It's really a privilege to watch really good butchers with very different approaches. Mm -hmm. You can get more money for sausage oh, in a casing. For sure. They just didn't right. Oh, we're going to rope. This is not an easy thing to do, <laughs> this braiding. He is twisting the sausage as he creates his chain. Yeah, that's really impressive, I must say. This is your last half hour of this challenge. Just to add a little bit of visual variety, I decide to do some coils. And that's something that we move a lot of in the summertime. <laughs> the nice thing about taking skewers, it keeps all that sausage together. Johnny using the rope technique on his yeah. sausage, oh, too. How you making out over there, John? Uh, I think I'm doing OK. I sneak a peek over at Johnny's table, and I'm blown away with how beautiful his display is. I cut some bones up like they are marrow bones. Use the knuckle bones for soup. I seem to have a petrified bone forest happening over nice. here. Nice. Bone hinge. <laughs> 10 minutes remaining, butchers. The center marrow bones, I cut them the long way and open them up if somebody wanted to try roasted ostrich marrow bone. One minute. Better hustle. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time. I think I got it. Johnny, Sean, great job, butchers. You gentlemen head back to the stock room and wait. We will be back to get you in a bit. Thank you. You were cranking, though. I did my best. I did my best. I was just like, holy shit. Butchering is also about eating. So we're going to test one of the cuts on the grill to see how it holds up. Roxanne, have you decided a cut that you would like to put on the grill for us? The London broils that they both have. Super similar, so we'll give this a go. If either doesn't cook well, it will be rejected and its value lost. You did a beautiful display, man. Thank you. True professional. What are your thoughts on Johnny's presentation? Beautiful display. I like how he did these tenderloin pieces. You can tell how he checked it. That meat's really soft, so it looks like it's going to cook up really, really tender. I love all this sausage work. The one thing I don't like, if you look at this pinwheel, all the air pockets, every one of those would pop. All that juice inside would go right into your grill. So he kind of threw these out as like bigger version of stir fry, but they kind of feel tough. You can see all the silver skin in here. I would have just doubled down probably on my stew meat or something. I don't know. 
between the two steaks, Sean's is much thinner and a bit more cleaned up. Johnny's has a little bit more of that uh, silver skin on it still. Immediately right off the bat, I can tell that uh, Sean's cooked pretty evenly just because of the thickness of the steak. And what's really interesting about Johnny's is that as this meat cooks, this silver skin does nothing but shrink and constrict, like a piece of plastic that's around your meat still. This is why you have to take this off on these leaner meats. Here we are at Sean's display. OK, one thing I really love here is these pinwheels. He's taking lean meat that he butterflied out, added his ground meat to it, and just literally rolled it right together. He, he took this and, and stuffed this and made basically what we call a cushion. Look at the tying is beautiful. You know, the Add stuffing that. isn't falling out. On the downside, one of the things I saw with Johnny, he double grind. With Sean, he did a lot of single grind. It would have just looked a lot yeah. better in the case. This is definitely a little bit tougher than cutting through duck or venison. Let's give Johnny's a whirl. Johnny's is a bit harder to get through because my knife is trying to work its way through this silver skin over here. Just based on the thickness of these steaks, the way that they were cleaned and the way that they were cut, I'm rejecting this cut from Johnny. Obviously, we have two incredibly talented butchers here. I'll let you guys get to work. Cool. Thanks. If I win the $10,000, the money uh, obviously would be great, but I don't think it's my main motivator. I think getting involved with something like this, I would like this to shine a spotlight on small-scale butchers and small-scale agriculture. When I became a butcher, I was 15. My first boss at the time said I wasn't butcher mentality, but here I am 33 years later. I'm getting up in age. I want to prove it to myself that I can handle this. Congratulations. Good luck. Good luck. Judges. Have you weighed the meat and determined which butcher has the highest dollar value? Yes, sir. We have. Let's bring the butchers back in. Butchers, before the judges inspected your cuts, your yields were within one pound of each other. Sean, you attack that ostrich at an unbelievable pace and deliver a very creative presentation full of quality retail cuts. Your final value, $1,354. Johnny, with more than 30 years of experience, you used your vast knowledge of retail cuts to yield lots of meat from your ostrich. Your total value, $1,128. Sean, congratulations. Wow. Johnny, I am sorry. Dave, any final words for Johnny? Johnny, man, your display, it's better than anything I put in my case. Unfortunately, we did have a kick a couple of your cuts. Um, what you were calling stir fry, we found it to be a bit tough to be stir fry, that it wouldn't properly cook. They kind of feel tough. You can see all the silver skin in here. And in a couple of the steaks, they seemed a bit too tough to be cooked as a steak. Johnny's is a bit harder to get through because my knife is trying to work its way through this silver skin over here. It was really, really close, man. Thank you. Thank you. Johnny, you're a heck of a competitor, but it is time for you to leave the shop. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Congratulations. I didn't win, but I still feel confident about things. I still feel cocky. I still feel like I'm the best butcher there is. Always ready to throw down. That's what I do. It's my game. Sean, you just won $10,000, and you <laughs> are the butcher champion. How are you feeling? Fantastic, because it's unreal. But now, I have a serious question. Mm -hmm. Do you paint? the way you butcher. Yeah, I'm a freaking machine. You know, <laughs> I, I, I can crank them out, yeah. Well, Sean, it's been fun watching you work, brother. Hey, thanks so much. No, my honor, man. Thank you. Thanks, great job, man. What a privilege, man, really. All right. I mean, it's amazing. This makes me feel like I did when I was a young butcher, that excited about trying to do good. This is one of the most amazing moments of my life. history, the butcher has been a linchpin to survival. In early civilizations, when foodborne diseases were claiming lives, it was the butcher, with their sharp tools and sharper skills, who kept death at bay. Across centuries, butchers were as highly regarded as doctors and eventually became a fixture in nearly every town across America. Today, there are thousands of people who cut meat, but only a select few with the expertise to call themselves Master Butcher. Tonight, in three escalating rounds to test speed. 30 minutes left. 
and precision. You are approved. Four of America's best butchers will battle it out for prize money and pride, culminating in a final challenge against a surprise beast. Oh my God. Right here on The Butcher. James, I love butchering. I think it's something primal, something we've been doing since we've been on this planet. I immerse myself every single day in this art. I am confident, but it comes with a lot of work. My name is Makala, and I have six years of butchering experience. I was a French literature major, and in my senior year, I took a hog butchery class. From there, I was just hooked on butchery. My name's Alan. I learned my skills as a butcher on the job, just like any good butcher should learn. You can read a book all you want, but until you actually take a knife and a hook to a carcass, you don't know my name's Chris, and I have eight years butchering experience. I'm part of the community. I get to watch kids grow up. I get to be invited into everyone's dinner table. Being a butcher is not really a job because it's a passion to do for the rest of my life. Welcome to the shop. At the end of the day, only one of you will be able to call yourself the butcher champion and walk out of here with $10,000. Judging this competition are some of the toughest experts in the industry. Hailing from the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee is the Reverend of Fat, Michael Sully Sullivan. She's been an avid hunter since her teens and is an accomplished chef who butchers whole animals. Say hi to Miss Roxanne Spruance. And he's a fourth generation butcher with over 30 years of experience, Dave the Butcher Budworth. I can't believe I'm standing facing the judges. It's very surreal. They know what they're talking about. This is a Russian nesting doll. It's a doll within a doll, inside a doll, and so on. What does this little doll have to do with butchery? Take a look in the meat locker right behind you. Tonight's round one challenge is for the birds. Five to be exact, turkey, duck, chicken, pheasant, and squab. I'm talking a bird within a bird within a bird within a bird within a bird. Why did it have to be birds? I don't like the meat, it's not firm, it's kind of slimy and only walks on two legs. <laughs> the term for embedding and cooking the meat of one animal inside that of another is engastration. Its origins date back to Roman times, but it's the European royals who took it to the next level. One of the most extreme examples is a feat of butchery called the roti sans pareil, which is French for the roast without equal. We're not talking about the three bird American fam favorite turducken. The roast without equal is a collection of 17 different birds stuffed inside one another. Today, the most common version of the roast without equal is made with five birds. For this challenge, you're gonna take those five birds, debone each bird working from the largest to the smallest, turkey, duck, chicken, pheasant, and then the squab. Once deboned, you will evenly stuff each bird inside the next bird. When they are all stuffed, they must be tied securely inside the turkey. I'm nervous. It's not something I've done for a very long time. One more twist. Once you debone your duck, you must also extract the foie gras or the liver. It must be completely intact with no damage to it. I've never extracted foie before. I know what it looks like out of the body of the animal, but not inside. In the end, the judges will inspect and score your overall presentation and the quality of your work. You will get one point for each acceptable bird, one point for the foie gras, and one point for your final bird roast. So you're looking at a total maximum of seven points. You have two hours for this challenge. The butcher with the lowest score will be asked to leave the shop. All right, butchers, here we go. On my mark, sit, cut. Oh, thank you. <laughs> After you, sir. Are we taking? Come back up there. Yeah. I know Chris, he used to work at my shop. He's gunning for me because I taught him just about everything he knows. He's my mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker. Luke, as me, you know, I'm handsomer. Of course you want to beat the guy that trained you. My strategy for this challenge is to just hammer these birds out and then worry about the minutia. I've never stuffed birds into birds. First thing I'm thinking of is 20 minutes per large bird, 15 minutes for my smaller birds, and then a half an hour to get the whole thing together. Any sport event you go to, you need to make sure you stick to your game plan. 
So silly. How do you get started deboning a bird? You can either tunnel the turkey where you go in and you remove the backbone without actually cutting through that skin at all, which is much harder. The other way, you can come down the backbone, split, and debone it out this way. If you cut the backbone, it's a lot more sewing, a lot harder to keep it together. I don't want to have to sew the thing back together. So if I can create a tunnel of the skin and meat, I can make it to where I won't have to tie anything. Oh. Oh. James was trying to separate the skin from the backbone, and he just popped right through. Well, we're going to sew now. I definitely feel James is my competition. That's who I've trained under. Any trick I have in my toolbox, he put there. I am co-owner and head butcher at Colorado Meat Company. We provide our patrons with grass-fed beef, elk, lamb, pork, bison, all locally sourced within 160 miles of our shop. I initially tried to tunnel out and I ran my thumb through half of the back skin. Change plan, I'm gonna be stitching it, so we'll just go. Before I came a butcher, I was being a punk ass teenager. I'm younger than everybody. I feel like an underdog. But my strength is understanding physiology of the animal and being able to take it apart piece by piece. I'm a butcher because I love my food. I love being close to it. It makes me nervous that Alan is hanging it off the table because that the skin is so fragile, it can tear so easily, and then you're done. Alan just took his cleaver, cut that thigh bone right out, so it leaves that nub. So juices while cooking won't come out. Any better presentation. You can stuff that thigh and that leg, and it has like a cap on the end, so your stuffing's not gonna fall out. The only serious injury I've had is an inch of a boning knife in between my ring finger and my index finger. That felt great. Right now, I'm going through the turkey, trying to figure out, is there anything that will make me lose points? Get it out now. I started the Chicago Meat Collective this year, and our mission is to teach home cooks how to work with their meat and also how to source meat sustainably. We hope that by giving people the tools to do some home butchery, they will buy meat more respectfully. I like that McCullough, she's really making sure to extract all that cartilage, all that bone, using her hands a lot. Again, we're talking finesse. Right. Chris has finished deboning his first bird, the turkey, and is moving on to his second, the duck, which is the bird they need to remove the foie gras from. Chris is trucking along. You cannot possibly be doing quality work if you're ripping through something. This is the first time I've eviscerated a duck like this. Sully, what's the difficult part about removing that foie? That foie is sitting so close to that skin, and if these guys cut too deep, mm. they're just gonna go right into the <coughs> foie. And then also extracting it out, making sure you're keeping it all in one piece. There's two lobes, you have to be really careful when you open it up that you don't split it. I know foie is very delicate, it's crumbly, and I can feel that I have it all in one piece, so I'm kind of stoked at this point. Having never done that before, Hooray. Alan's got the least experience of anybody here. He's obviously boned some birds out. Once I get the whole rib cage detached, I'm gonna yank its liver out. I've never worked with a duck before. I've only seen foie gras in a little tin. So I pull it out, and first thing I do, I'm looking for a liver. <gasps> you just ripped it in half. All that work. That's why you have to separate it from the cavity first. Right now, I'm doubting myself because I'm looking through this duck's innards, and I'm not seeing a liver. I think I foobarred my foie gras. <gasps> oh my God, make him stop. Cody, Wyoming, 21 years old. I wonder how much foie he's seen. The butchers are 20 minutes into this challenge. Debone five birds and then stuff them into one another. Chris is moving on to his third bird, the chicken. Alan and James are on their second, the duck while McCullough is still on her first, the turkey. Turkey's done, duck is done. Three more birds left. I grab all three at once. I don't want to have to go back into the cooler. We see James trying to scoop the fog out without taking anything off. I've never eviscerated a duck, but coming from the culinary world, I know exactly what I'm looking for. The big shape, the big size. There we go. There she is. He kept it intact. Can't wait to examine that. Butchers, you are 30 minutes into this challenge. 90 minutes left. I get a time crunch on me. I do stress a little. It really puts the heat on you. Alan is over there showing his love of poultry. I may have messed up the foie gras, 
but my birds look pretty good. I'm excited about the duck. I kind of want to open up the rib cage so I can eviscerate it that way, but I'm also a little worried about hitting the flaw. If I use my knife, I might poke down in and damage the flaw. So I'm going to use these poultry shears to open up the rib cage. I'm beginning to see the edge of the flaw. It's huge. It's filling the entire cavity of this duck. It's really, really soft. Or if I push too hard, it's going to have my fingerprints on it. It's like butter, basically. Alan and Chris are working on three out of five right now. As soon as I get into that chicken, I immediately realize moving from duck to chicken. That muscle memory reflex has to be retrained. It's much more floppy, a lot more difficult to work with. And one thing I really liked about Alan, he's already staging. He's already layering. I feel like I'm dressing a bird with another bird. That's a pretty disturbing thought for me. After tearing his turkey, James is now tunneling his duck. I think the way James is doing it, when you get down to those small birds, that's that's really hard. In terms of experience, Roxanne, how many different birds have you stuffed inside one another? I think I've done up to four. Sully, have you ever done more than four? Seven. Really? Yes. Dave, how many have you done? Four. Four. Nice. Time to do the chicken. I'm picking up the pace. I just want to keep this momentum going. For a guy that hates doing any poultry, Alan's really embraced this challenge. I'm approaching the pheasant just like all of the other birds, spine first. The strategy seems to be efficient, and I notice I look to my left and I'm right behind Chris. Look at Chris, he's moved onto his last bird. He's up on the squab now. What is a squab exactly? It's a pigeon, literally a pigeon. Chicken is the most familiar bird, but boning them from the inside out is not something I get to do every day. You gonna finish, James? No, I, will you come help me? You never showed me this, James. I'm a horrible teacher. Of the five birds we're dealing with here today, what might be the most difficult to debone? The squab. Yeah, it's much more finesse. The bones are really delicate and small. And because they're so much smaller, you can actually snap the bones, which then makes it hard to get mm -hmm. fragments out. I'm on my final bird, the squab. This is ridiculous. It's tiny. You notice he looked at it three, four different ways oh, yeah. before, before he, he started. Missed. I'm choking up on the knife right now. The bones on this thing are just so delicate. And this is a technique that I learned working with a taxidermist. You got to be really precise when you're turning out buffalo ears. James, he's still got two birds left. Just because you have the two hours doesn't mean that you shouldn't move at a good pace. It doesn't allow you any time to fix anything mm -hmm. if something goes wrong. I feel good. I feel confident. Ever since my first mishap, I feel like I've been right on where I want to be. Chris got his rib cage out of his squab. Now to get those tiny little toothpick leg bones out there. I know. Chris is treating that knife almost like a scalpel. Those birds are so hard. 30 minutes left on the clock. Tunneling out the pheasant, I have a lot more confidence. You can actually separate a lot of the meat from the bones with your hand. Looking at these five birds that I have to get inside of each other just seems very daunting. You're actually stuffing the legs of one into the legs of another, and it's not just laid in there. I got everything in the turkey. Now all I have to do is make sure I am sew this thing up nice. Everybody's on squab or tying, except for James. Yeah. Yes, he just moved to his fourth bird, the pheasant. I'm done with all the birds. First order of business, I want to get all of the limbs matched up, sock in a sock. I love taking the leg into the leg socket. Absolutely. That's the way it's supposed to be done. We are now at 15 minutes. I'm making some of my last ties. I do start to worry. Did I forget anything? But it's sewn up at this point, so we just have to turn it in. My strategy, use the turkey skin like a bag, get everything settled in so it's even when I go to sew it up. Alan, make it sure it's going to be nice and tight. Mm -hmm. And James is still working on that squab. You can literally seam almost the whole thing out with your hands. Tunneling it out, you almost just peel it back. Going right under the armpits of my turkey. Oh, no, try again. Is there a technique that works better than the other? I would start at the neck, and I would work my way down, flip the bird over, truss the legs, flip it back over, and tie it back at the neck. And when you truss a bird, it plumps the breast cavity up mm -hmm. so that it cooks evenly. I am surprised that I'm the first one done knowing my competition. Chris is now finished with this challenge. I really do feel that this is a contender for first place. As I'm starting to stuff these birds, they're fitting in perfectly. Here's the advantage of him doing all the tunneling. He's literally just inserting one bird 
into the other. I love seeing that technique. I've done both ways, and I usually come from the backbone and open that bird up. It's a little quicker. Now I gotta sew this thing up. Butchers, 10 minutes left on the clock. It's not as easy as it looks. It's very floppy, right? We've taken all of the bones yeah. out. There's nothing really holding it together. No, it's, it's worse than trying to tie cello. My left hand is starting to cramp. I'm ready to finish this thing. I'm almost done sewing, but before I close this bird up, I've got to adjust everything, make sure everything's nice, tight, and firm in a line. I think that's rather handsome. This is about end product quality. Alan is the second butcher to present his bird. I took the knobs off my turkey legs. That was not a good idea. I'm really trying to trust this thing up. Things just keep flopping out. The legs are just not staying together. McCullough places her bird down on the presentation table, leaving James as the only butcher still working. I think if I'm given two hours. 10 seconds left. I should use the two hours. Three, two, one. Time's up. Nice work, butchers. It is now time for the judges to come down and inspect the work both inside and out. Please head back to the stock room. I smell like poultry. Yep, really? I do too. And you know <laughs> judges, here we are at James' table. We're evaluating presentation, individual birds, and the foie gras. It's got a nice shape to it. He did not tie his neck up, so when this cooks, it's gonna expand. You're gonna lose a lot of moisture, and also the meat is gonna slowly kind of start to push out this way. I really like he left the nubs on. It made it so much easier to tie when he came down to trusting this. My big concern is my torn turkey. But the only way you can recover from this is to get some extra skin and lace it on. I'm surprised he didn't. My first impressions are how uneven these birds are sitting. You can see the top of the duck breast right here, and the top of the chicken is all the way down here. He is the only one that tunneled, which does make them layer a little differently. Mm -hmm. I luckily had worked with those smaller birds before. Here we are at McCullough's. Since she took the knobs off her feet, she was unable to figure out a way to tie those properly. I would have liked to have seen a straight line instead of this kind of Frankenstein line. Nice distribution. Super nice. Mm -hmm. This would carve so nicely after you cook it. Absolutely beautiful foie. Until I got to the duck, destroyed the foie, I think I did good. Here we are at Allen's. Well, I'm looking at really nice shape, very firm. Let's look at the squab. I got a giant bone right here. That's, you know, something that's really important because that kind of bone could cut somebody. I watched him rip this apart and heard him going, where is the liver? That thing looks like somebody took a hammer to it. But now he knows he will never make this mistake ever again in his life. How'd you feel you did, though? I definitely beat you. <laughs> <laughs> I was comfortable with the turkey, the duck, and the chicken. I've seen them before. Chris finished first. This is our last presentation table. Tension, I say, is great. Great stitching. He really doubled up that skin. There is an entire chicken wing in here that I'm trying to cut through. Wow, that does not bode well. I actually can't get through. Oh, that is not that's good. That's sad, that's, that's a shame. Every bird is supposed to be completely deboned. I enjoy that nobody feels like they completely lost and nobody feels like they completely won. Anyway, high five, good luck. Butchers. Your birds have been inspected, points counted, but only three of you will move on to the next round. The butcher going home is... Your birds have been inspected. You are looking at a total maximum of seven points, and so the results are in. McCullough, you have a final score of six. James, your final score is five. Congratulations to you both. You're moving on in the competition. You can head back to your workstations. In this case, slow and steady really did win the race. Alan and Chris, it's down to you two. Chris, you flew through this challenge, but the judges found quite a few bones. Alan, for somebody that hates poultry, you did a pretty good job with this. <laughs> but the judges did find some bones in your squab, and your foie gras was completely destroyed. Chris, this leaves you with a final score of three. Alan, your final score is four. Congratulations, you are moving on. Chris, of all the birds that we see, yours is by far the prettiest, but when we cut into it, three of your birds still had the wings left on it. 
All right, Chris, thanks for being here. Please exit the shop. Thank you, guys. I'm devastated. <sighs> I take a lot of pride. I work hard. So it's heartbreaking that I did it fast, but <laughs> I didn't quite do it all right. Butchers, one challenge down and two to go. You're going to have to grind it out in this next challenge. We like to call it the burger battle. Humans have been eating ground meat for thousands of years. In the 12th century, the Mongols would eat ground meat while riding on horseback. The Russians adapted the Mongols' ground meat into steak tartare. However, the origin of the hamburger is widely disputed. But it's no secret that America loves burgers. In fact, we eat more than 50 billion here each year. That is billion with a B. A true master butcher should be an expert at portion control, meaning they can prepare a customer's specific order accurately without even using a scale. In the meat locker are tubs full of chuck trim. You will each grab a tub and then using the grinders, make ground beef, which you will form into patties of varying weights. Four quarter pound patties, four third pound patties, and four half pound patties. You will take one patty at a time up to Sully. Sully's gonna weigh it and he's gonna inspect the quality. Here's the kicker. You don't get to see how much it weighs. We don't get to know how much they weigh. That adds another level of complexity to it. If your patty comes in underweight, he's gonna reject it, throw it away. If it comes in overweight, you'll have the opportunity to correct it. First two butchers to make 12 perfect patties at the correct weights will move forward to the final round. All right, let's do this. Butchers, ready? Set, grind. This is a race against my competitors. So I need to figure out what I need to do to be as efficient as possible. I think back to what we do every day at the facility, and that is package one pound packs of ground beef. So if I can portion those out, it can give me a base to where I need to start. What is trim? Trim is extra red meat, extra fat from what the butchers are cutting that day. We can't just throw that away. It's money, and also it makes great hamburger. This quarter pound burger is gonna be really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It's really deceivingly thin. I don't think a normal thing that I would do. My burgers are closer to like six or eight ounces. Yep. James is the first one to pay a visit to Sully. He needs this patty to weigh four ounces. James, your patty is over. James' first attempt comes in a little heavy. The biggest challenge is going to be having no idea how over I am. This challenge is going to be super tough. First two butchers to make 12 perfect patties at the correct weights will move forward to the final round. My main goal is to get a base to work off for the rest of the competition. So being over on the first one, I take a little off. Then I can continue to base off of that. James trying to hit that first quarter pound patty. Your patty is in weight. Yeah. There we go. Quarter James, pound patty. first one on the scoreboard. Alan, you're over. Thank you, sir. James, now back at Sully Station. Congratulations, your second patty. Beautiful. I'm going to cut what I think is about a pound into what is about four pieces. Look at her eyeballing mm -hmm. that burger. Yes. McCullough, congratulations. Ooh, McCullough. Your first patty. Puts a point on the board. This is what a quarter pound feels like. I've really got to use all my senses and do it again and again. Congratulations, your third patty. Wow, Thanks, there it is. This is a quarter pound patty. Thank you. Oh, there Beautiful. You go. Oh, okay. has two of her four quarter pound patties. I came here to cut meat, not make hamburgers. Well, congratulations, Alan. You have your first patty. All three butchers are on the board. James, you have your fourth patty. All right. James has closed out the quarter pound patty. Moving on to third pounders, I'm enjoying leading the pace. If they can ballpark a pound, they can then cut it into four for the quarters, thirds for the thirds, mm -hmm. and two for half. Now I'm going to try and make four equal size balls. So that way, I don't have to continue to guess what size we're at. Bacala. This is beautiful. Oh, Put her out. There it Thank is. you. McCullough now moving on to the third pound. 
Roxanne, what makes the perfect hamburger patty? It's got to be a nice mix of meat to fat, kind of form it together. It really does serve a purpose for cooking so that it holds together. McCullough now trying to take the lead with this patty. She needs it to weigh five and a half ounces. This is approved. Oh, oh McCullough first gets her. attempt. Yeah. McCullough takes the lead. Still anybody's battle. James, congratulations. This is awesome. Oh, man. Oh. James answers. Alan trying to close out the quarters. Alan, congratulations. Oh, OK. Oh, there we go. Now we got a race. All butchers are now on their third pound patties, seeing a sense of urgency from all three of them now. Approved. Oh. <laughs> Beautiful. Congratulations. Oh. It's neck and neck with those two. Approved. Approved. Thank you. Quickly, James comes back up. Nice work. Oh, oh man, James. And McCullough, this one is also approved. Thank you. Oh, oh, man. Like McCullough Tied ties up. it up. James is up to the scale. He's shooting for eight ounces. It is over. OK. I start to just pinch away, trying to take about a half ounce away. Approved. Oh, James, nice. first one to strike with his first of four half pound patties. The pinch method is working. Sigh of relief back in the lead. James, you're finding your groove. This is also approved. I'm like majorly checking out patties to figure out exactly the size and shape to get third pounders. Alan, this is approved. Thank you, nice. sir. There you go. Oh. Alan within one patty of catching McCullough. McCullough, this time you are under. Oh, oh man. This is approved. Oh, James. Congratulations. Oh, oh man. Alan ties All things right. up with McCulloch. James. Really good? Got one more to go. Approved for your final one. There it is. All right. And with that, James is the first butcher to make it into the final round. My ears are ringing with magic because he tells me it's approved. I'm going on to the next challenge. Now it's about seeing who I'm going to be up against. It is now a battle between McCullough and Allen. Allen, congratulations. Yeah. Oh, Allen takes Alan. the lead. After I gained a lead on McCullough, that was the point where I could finally start to breathe and really just focus on getting it right. Allen, congratulations. Your second half pound patty. OK. Oh. Beautiful patty, but you're over. Oh. Oh. Alan, you found your groove. It is oh. approved. Ooh. Alan scores another point. He only needs one patty. Oh, McCullough, yeah. you know, when she's over, she only has to pull a little mm -hmm. bit out and just kind of quickly reform it and get back up there. Alan is one burger away. She has to stop forming and get up to Sully. Beautiful patty, and it's approved. Thank you. There you go. Oh, oh snap. Go. McCullough yeah. only needs two patties. She's already got one made. Congratulations. Oh, oh. Alan ties things up. Both butchers wow, need one patty. McCullough's closing the gap. I'm nervous. Ellen, you are approved. Oh, wow. And just like that, Alan scores the fourth of his half pound burgers. Nice job, That'll yeah. That'll do it. I'm very nervous going into the final round. I'd really like to leave with that 10 grand. Roxanne, anything you'd like to say to McCullough? McCullough, I'm so bummed to see you go. We can tell that you have a ton of precision, and I think that attention to detail maybe is what got you today. McCullough, thank you for being here, but it is time for you to leave the shop. Good luck, guys. It was awesome meeting you. I am definitely frustrated to be going home. I don't think that challenge showcased my greatest skills, but we all have to perform under pressure, and I think it's valid. This is it. After this next challenge, one of you will be walking out of here with the title of Butcher Champion and a check for $10,000. The only thing standing in your way is what's behind this big black curtain. It is time to meet the beast. <laughs> it is time to meet the beast. Opa. <laughs> Why? 
Why? I've never butchered a whole fish on this scale. This is just completely alien to me. I've had experience cutting fish before, but nothing like this. It's a fish that goes by many names, moonfish, kingfish, but ask a butcher or fishmonger, and he or she will likely call it by its common name, Opa. Swimming in the ocean at depths between 165 and 1,600 feet, these creatures of the sea can tip the scales at up to 200 pounds. Nearly all of the opa sold in the United States comes from Hawaii, where it is caught sustainably by line. In your business, it is all about the yield and adding value. You are to butcher as much meat as you can from your opa fish and create as many retail cuts as possible. An intact OPA can fetch $275, but a master butcher can pull almost $1,000 from this monster of the deep. In the end, the judges will assess the quality of your cuts, weigh the worthy pieces, and then add up the total dollar value of your yield. The highest overall value is going to win it all. You will have access to all the tools and equipment in the shop, including the grinders and stuffers. You will have 60 minutes to complete this task. Doing a whole fish in 60 minutes? Seriously? <laughs> Let's do this. Three, two, one, cut! What are gonna be the keys to getting a good yield from this OPA? This fish actually has seven different muscles. Each one cooks a little different, has a little different texture, different flavor. Down by the gills, if you find this little cap that you can take off of the belly, you can find both the ab and adductor that are dark, dark red, like a dark tuna. Both have a higher penny per pound value than any other part of the fish. So find those little treasures behind that gill. Okay. Also, fish are inherently very fragile. I'm looking for them not to manhandle this, but to be very gentle. Wow, for one <laughs> slice. I'm completely out of my element. What I do every time something's new is just throw myself into it 110%. I'm thinking I just want to get it taken apart. That way I can start filleting, portioning, and hopefully making sausage in the end. I run and grab a cleaver. I want to get that tail off so I can figure out where the peak is to segment the fish properly. Wow. You don't actually need to take the tail off. You could come across the middle of it with a spine, or you can do what they're doing and come in all the way around and lift up and get into that spine and go over it. Alan found that center spine. He's just tossing this around so aggressively, and it'll fall apart super quickly on you. I'm starting to notice as I get off these fillets, there's a lot of different muscles in here. So I'm kind of going to seam it out just like I do with beef and pull it out muscle by muscle. You see right there? That's that hidden piece of meat. That abductor and adductor. Okay, there's a seam. Finally, I've got something familiar. I found that this fish has a seam and it's opened up. I can see that membrane. I'm going to run with it. <laughs> Those are great cuts. The flavor of it is a lot like tuna. Most of the time when people grind parts of opa, it's the abductor and the adductors. There's your abductor right there. Is he going to know what to do with that? That's going to be my question. Also, once you get that abductor off, that adductor is kind of in there, but it's covered in this membrane, so it could look like it's an organ, and they might not harvest it. I start slicing my second filet, and I notice this incredibly marble belly. Look how much fat is in there. So I started slicing little sashimi pieces. You always want it thin, but thick enough that you have a bite to it. I know that belly of any animal always demands a premium. That's actually good. He pulled that whole abductor off, and you can see underneath the adductor. And it's hidden right inside. That is really praised. I think he's pulling it out right now. There he goes. That was a nice job pulling out that adductor from the center. I mean, James has worked with fish before, but he still hasn't pulled his adductors. He hasn't cut into the head at all. Wow. James using a spoon over there? Just a simple spoon that you can actually get right between those bones. All that meat can be scraped, and you can do something with it. Beats leaving money on the bone. I want to make sure that I get everything off I want to. So I go to the top cheek, get those off. I know those are going to be worth some extra money. Jane, doing a lot of intricate trimming. And this is a fish you don't have to do a lot of trimming. Just kind of shape it up. Yeah. And just display them nice. Butchers, 30 minutes left. I'm very worried about the time. I thought I was going to have plenty. There's a lot left to be done. I'm curious to see if either James finds the abductor or Alan does anything with it. One found, one not. Neither are used. 
All right, Butchers, 30 minutes left. James, he's speeding himself up. He's definitely feeling a sense of urgency. And, and Alan's definitely matching him. Excuse me, Fish. I started to portion these center cut loin chops. I'm just pushing forward. In order to have variety, I'm gonna cut some of this into shabu shabu. That's hot broth that you cook your meat in. Usually it's wagyu beef, why not fish? Alan's lining some stuff up on the butcher paper. It's a bit thicker maybe for shabu shabu. Exotic cuts like that are a great way to boost value. I'm done portioning, starting to put it out. I'm trying to present it as I would in a butcher shop. You wanna leave a little bit of space. You wanna make it attractive to be able to get customers to buy it. There's a lot of steaks going down over on James's table. Everything just like poof. I'm relying on my tactile sense and I'm feeling that this is a good tender piece and I wanna present it in a way that end user can cut to their liking. Those two big pieces of fish are beautiful, but if somebody came and bought that whole piece, I'd have to get 10, 15, 20% less for it because they're buying in volume. Whereas if I cut it into steaks, it's much more valuable. Now it's time to grind. I pull out my trim bucket and realize that I have way more meat than I need to make sausage. So I'm gonna make a few more burgers than I was originally anticipating. Alan's pulling the grinder out. Is he gonna grind the abductor? A real popular way is taking that abductor muscle and you make it into sausage. He doesn't realize that's usable meat. Butchers, you have five minutes left in this challenge. It's crunch time, and my priority is to get this grind out as quickly as possible. I believe we're gonna see <laughs> some is, Opa sausage. This is, this is, abductor muscle have been so much better in this application. I know. I'm extremely concerned that James is just gonna forego mm -hmm. the abductor and the adductor. Since we're looking at this from added value, what you can sell, I think it would be hard to sell a coil of fish sausage. James pulling a cleaver. I'm trying to get every last bit off this carcass so that way my yield goes up. Oh, that's tough fish. Come here. I think he's gonna find the abductor right now. I think he's gonna cut right through it. <gasps> Alan now grabbing a tomahawk <laughs> off the back. Whoa, and his oh, grinder almost takes his spill. Come on. I did say he has access to all the tools and equipment in the shop. I'm chopping at this thing with the tomahawk because I want bones for stock. Less bone on the table, more yield. 30 seconds left. Let's whack up some stew meat. Oh no, he's cubing up his abductor meat and he didn't even clean any of the silver skin off. 10, nine, oh my God. eight, oh, no, no, seven, stop. six, Not five, a <laughs> four, three, two, one, time. That was a hell of a race, dude. All right, Butchers, great work. Roxanne is now going to select one cut of your OPA and put it through her cut and chew test. Dave and Sully are gonna do a further inspection. Please head back to the stock room. Roxanne, you decided what you're gonna grill up? I have. Because Alan left so many whole pieces, it really only leaves us with one option, these steaks from that center loin. I'm gonna grab another steak from James and I'll see you guys in a bit. Excellent. If either doesn't cook well, it will be rejected and its value lost. My retail mindset took over and instead of cutting steaks, it was primals. I mean, that's exactly how we do it at a butcher shop in Nashville. This is Alan's display. What are your thoughts? I really like his shabu shabu idea. He cut it right across the grain. It looks absolutely gorgeous. We see a little bit of the abductor muscle that he diced up at the last moment. Not what we were looking for here. It's not cleaned up. There's silver skin on it. He made sausage without salt. If I cut into this, it would just crumble. And we provided salt for both of them. You can see right here on Alan's piece is just a product of it being manhandled during breakdown. It's hard to demand full value when your product looks like this. Here we are at James. I think overall yield is great. I mean, there's a lot of money sitting on this table because these are seamed out from this has really broken into its individual money cuts. I like how he loined it out. These are nice, even pieces. His little sashimi belly, he went with the grain instead of against the grain. So these would be very tough. And he got these little nuggets, but then he missed. The, the whole abductor. Abductor and, and, and the, the abductor yeah. muscle. So the most valuable yeah. cuts of this fish are still Coming in back. his fish. Alan's piece feels okay as I'm cutting through it, but what's happening on my knife is just a product of all of this stuff coming off. James's is super flaky. It's really soft. It actually breaks apart just like you would expect. Alan's, the mouthfeel isn't great. Probably would have ground this into burgers. 
James is uh, it's really soft. It's really tender. The texture and the mouthfeel is so much better. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to reject Ellen's cut. I work very hard at what I do. If I win the 10K, I could spend a nice long week with my lovely family. Winning the $10,000 would allow me to continue my education. I'm gonna go to the meat science lab. I'm gonna get a degree and work my way into the USDA. Judges, have you weighed the meat and determined which butcher has the highest value? Yes, sir. Let's bring the butchers back into the shop. James, you made very good choices with the OPA, but the best cuts of meat are still sitting there on your butcher block. Alan, I don't think anybody expected you to come in and take down two more experienced butchers. James, your total value is $744. Alan, your final value, $601. Congratulations, James. Job, brother. Alan, man, I can't even legally speak about what I was doing when I was 21. <laughs> you got greatness ahead of you, but you had to pull off your abductor. It's not cleaned up, there's silver skin on it. Also, your sausages, they weren't salted, they wouldn't bind, so they wouldn't be able to cook properly. We had to disqualify those. Alan, it is time for you to leave the shop. Thank you, guys. Hey, thank you, man. Thank you. Best to you, brother. It's been an amazing experience. I've learned a lot. That's the most valuable thing in this competition. Not the $10,000, the experience and the lessons that you learn. King James. You just won $10,000, brother. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Nice Thank work. You. How Thank you feeling? I'm on cloud nine. I love the craft I get to be a part of every day. Happy to be here standing alone. Thank James, you. you are the butcher champion. Amazing. Nice work, man. Excellent job. It was an incredibly hard competition. I came in here knowing my skills and the butcher definitely challenged it. It was so much fun. I met so many great people and I won. <laughs>